Anchorage Assembly to order. Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Yes, Mr. Chair. Mr. Dunbar. Here. Ms. Kennedy. Here. Mr. Peterson. Present. Ms. LaFrance. Here. Mr. Rivera. Present. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Here. Mr. Constant. Here. Ms. Allard. Here. Mr. Perez Verdia. Here. Ms. Zelotel. Here. Mr. Weddleton. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, with that, we need to take a quick break uh, because of a technical issue. Apologies. John Crabb, could you please help us with a technical issue at the dais? One, two, three. Okay, great, we're good. Thanks everyone. All right, so moving on to the Pledge of Allegiance. Ms. LaFrance, can you lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Mr. Wilbur, can you please read the land acknowledgement? There you go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, a land acknowledgement is a formal statement recognizing the indigenous people of a place. It is a public gesture of appreciation for the past and present indigenous stewardship of the lands that we now occupy. It is an actionable statement that marks our collective movement towards decolonization and equity. The Anchorage Assembly would like to acknowledge that we gather today on the traditional lands of the Denina Athabascans. For thousands of years, the Denina have been and continue to be the stewards of this land. It is with gratefulness and respect that we recognize the contributions, innovations, and contemporary perspectives of the Upper Cook Inlet Denina. Thank you, Mr. Wilbur. Moving on, minutes of previous meetings, there are none. Mayor's report. Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Rockenstedt was not completed last night and had a few words he wanted to add. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I, I just wanted to uh, comment there was a uh, pretty uh, egregious uh, false um, uh, accusation that was made in um, a news uh, organization this afternoon that accused the municipality of actually having already entered into a contract um, for the Golden Lion, and I want to state on the record that is 100% categorically false. Um, uh, we have not entered into any type of an agreement to purchase the Golden Lion. Uh, we have to, required by uh, municipal code, get approval from the assembly prior to entering into uh, any uh, agreement to purchase uh, any uh, facility. So. Just wanted to put that on the record, uh, just in case anyone uh, emailed any of uh, the members and were asking about what the administration was doing. So thank you. Thank you. Moving on to the assembly chair's report. <clears throat> I want to um, welcome the uh, public from afar and um, thank uh, the members, the public, and others for uh, the accommodations during this uh, pandemic. Also want to um, remind the members about the all-day meeting that we have this Friday and invite the public to participate uh, over the phone and we'll also have a visual um, Facebook live feed that you'll be able to watch. Um, and it'll be a continuation of our discussions regarding uh, CARES Act funding and COVID-19 relief. 
Um, looking forward to that on this f upcoming Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, and then I will reserve the remainder of my time for a presentation from um, Beth Nordland. Uh, we will have a quick presentation from her and the um, about uh, YEP, the Youth Employment in uh, Parks. Um, with that, we'll move on to committee and liaison reports uh, until 5.30, which is when we will be calling uh, Ms. Nordland. We'll start on this side with Mr. Weddleton. Seems like we heard just yesterday. I didn't write anything up. Community Economic Development Committee met last Thursday and reviewed a couple of the marijuana licenses we'll see near the end of the meeting, around 7.38, right? And uh, um, comment on that. AMAT's Policy Committee I missed, so I believe that to um, Ms. Alatel to speak on. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Ms. Alatel. Um, thank you. Uh, no report for the Committee on Homelessness. Um, but uh, for AMATS, we um, passed a TIP amendment um, that uh, just basically shifted um, some, basically brought everything up to date due to um, some different um, restrictions on some of the projects. So um, nothing um, terribly uh, concerning um, and we will be kind of diving in a little bit more on some AMATS related stuff coming up here soon as a body. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Weddleton, you remembered something? Thanks, I did. And it's important that the, to the Community Economic Development Committee, we also reviewed um, changes to fees for uh, at building services. We had made dramatic changes in the fees at the end of last year that kicked in for this year. And there were some features of that that were very troubling and made things very expensive for particularly roofs and uh, like um, small bathroom remodels with plumbers. And we've been working for a few months kind of looking at alternatives. And the um, building safety department with Mr. Schutte came up with an alternative um, that seems to work at the, uh, works the, the, for the city, uh, the home builders and others who looked at it seemed fairly positive about it. And I just want to really thank the staff who did that. They did it in a very positive way. The, the change that was causing trouble actually came from us, not from them, but they dealt with it in a very positive way, and I think we landed in a really good spot. So I want to thank them, and that will kick in for the next year. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Perez Verdia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, no update tonight. Thank you. Ms. Allard. Thank you, Chair. So I just wanted to update that we're going to have on Thursday, August the 6th, I'm looking at setting up a meeting for the audit committee. That's okay. it. Nothing else. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Constant. Nothing to report. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. LaFrance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I co-chair the Health Policy Committee with Vice Chair Quinn Davidson, and we have a meeting scheduled for next week via Teams on Wednesday, August 5th at 10 a.m., and right now we've got a couple items on the agenda. One, we'll go over the Anchorage Health Department's recommendations. We've already seen these, but we'll review them on allocating the alcohol tax revenues. And then we'll also revisit the recommendations that were put forward from the Community Substance Misuse Assessment from last year. The uh, Budget and Finance Committee won't be meeting until Thursday, August 20th, and that's gonna be via te Teams at noon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Nothing for me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Ethics and Election Committee um, met on July 22nd, and uh, we discussed uh, tracking ballots. We had a presentation over the phone from a company that that uh, does this for several jurisdictions around the country. And uh, that's something we're gonna look, look into uh, uh, to find additional information. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just wanted to mention that the Public Safety Committee meeting is scheduled for um, uh, next Wednesday, uh, not tomorrow, but next week, uh, August the 5th. 
And we are looking at changing the time of that meeting. Uh, there is another event that coincides with our regular meeting time, and that's uh, the Anchorage Economic Development Corporation's uh, presentation. So a lot of members wanted to go to that. So we may be moving that meeting uh, of the Public Safety Committee to 930. Um, so stay tuned for confirmation on that. Uh, one of the topics of conversation at that meeting will be uh, Ms. Zolotel's ordinance on chokehold ban. So um, anyway, like I said, just kind of keep watching for an update on the time of that meeting. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No report this evening. Thank you. All right, let's go ahead and go through our late on the table items. <clears throat> We're going to go through these one by one. So first, we have AR number 2020-273. Oh, and I guess for the members of the public, uh, we are just um, going through our late on the table procedure to add these to the agenda. Um, so we have AR number 2020-273, a resolution of the municipality of Anchorage authorizing uh, the funding of an outreach and education program on uses of CARES Act funding for 50,000 from the state direct federal pass-through grants fund. Um, yeah, this is my item, so I cannot make a motion, but can someone um, make the motion to lay this on the table? Move to lay on the table. Second. Moved and seconded. Mr. Rivera. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, so, uh, this item is uh, $50,000, and um, it is uh, for the Northwest Strategies contract. The administration has a contract with them to assist with uh, media placement and communications in regard to uh, COVID-19 efforts. And so this is specific to our efforts, as we have outlined in previous meetings, specifically the July 17th all-day meeting where we had talked about the need to have some type of mass and broadcast communications so that members of the public are aware of the efforts that we are undergoing. Thank you, Mr. Rivera. Mr. Constant? Yeah, thank you. With, with one uh, just addition to your comments, I would offer that one of the purposes of this is to ensure that in advance of our vote on the 11th, we've broadly solicited input from the public on their thoughts about how we could spend these dollars mm -hmm. so that we ensure that the public has been consulted properly. Mr. Rivera? Uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Yeah, on Mr. Constant's point, absolutely. Um, that is something that is being taken into account and um, Northwest Strategies is looking at some type of um, comment or other type of section where folks can uh, send their comments directly to assembly members after reviewing the proposals which we'll, we will put online. So absolutely we are taking that into account. Thank you Mr. Rivera. Um, just a reminder this is just the vote to lay this item on the table. Um, it is uh, timely uh, seeing as this next meeting is August 11th where we will be likely voting on the various priorities. Uh, with that, members may proceed to vote. Ms. Kennedy. Yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. That passes 11 to 0. Um, and uh, the clerk advises me that this will be item 10E7. Uh, the next item is an S version to an item. So it's a supplemental, so we don't need to take the vote on it. Um, but just to read it into the record, it is AR number 2020-256S, a resolution of the Anchorage Assembly regarding the mayor's orders and regulations issued under the proclamation of emergency. Next, we have an unnumbered AR, a resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly authorizing funding to build the capacity of the Assembly Office and Assembly Council's Office to respond to the COVID-19 emergency for $175,000 from the CARES Act funds previously appropriated to the State Direct Federal Pass-Through Grants Fund. Is there a motion to lay on the table? Motion to lay on the table. Second. 
It's moved and seconded. Uh, Ms. Zolotel. Um, thank you. Um, this is laid on the table um, due to the crunch of time and lack of capacity of both members as well as council and even the administration. So I think it's timely um, and it's timely and I would like us to be able to um, expand our capacity um, as we work towards these big, bigger CARES Act packages so that we can lay out as full of proposals as possible um, so that then the public has something fulsome to respond to. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote on the motion to lay this on the table. Ms. Kennedy. Yeah. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. That passes 11 to 0, so that item is laid on the table. And the number for that item is 10E8. Next, we have a um, unnumbered AR, a resolution of the Anchorage Assembly urging the governor, state legislature, Alaska court system, the mayor, and members of the community to take measures to alleviate the anticipated eviction tsunami resulting from the economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Is there a motion to lay this on the table? Move to lay this on the table. Second. Moved and seconded. Mr. Rivera. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, so this is also a, a very timely item. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get this uh, into the uh, addendum on time. Uh, the timeliness of this is due to the fact that um, unemployment benefits end uh, at the end of this month, the increase of the unemployment benefits. So all of the related studies uh, anticipate that August will be when this quote unquote eviction tsunami uh, begins. So it's important that we take this up uh, before August. Thank you, Mr. Rivera. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote to lay this on the table. Ms. Kennedy. Yeah. Mr. Peterson. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Oh. Ms. Quinn Davidson? Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia? Yes. That motion passes 10 to 1. It will be laid on the table. And the number is 10B5. Now for the last one, we have unnumbered AR, a resolution of the Anchorage Assembly requiring appointment, confirmation, and engagement of members of the Stormwater Utility Commission before award of contract per request for a proposal 2019 P022. Is there a motion? Move to lay on the table. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, Ms. LaFrance. Uh, yeah. Mr. Thank you, Chair, Ms. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I don't have that. Could you please have those sent to those of us on the phone? Sure. We'll go ahead and take a short break while we email that to the members. Hey, what are the numbers so far? I got 10 E7. I'm ready for bed already.
go through the numbers one more time. Okay. Just so that the numbers are yeah. more aware. Travis, could you confirm when you've emailed those again? Thank you. While uh, we are waiting for that to be emailed out to the members, I'm just going to go through the numbers once again. So the AR 2020-273, the 50,000 appropriation uh, authorization, rather, that's item 10E7. Uh, the 175,000 from Zolotel, um, that authorization is 10E8. The um, eviction tsunami resolution for action by uh, myself, uh, that item is 10B5. And then the one that we have upcoming uh, regarding the stormwater utility, the SWU commission, that is item 10B6, if it gets laid on the table. Okay, so members should have that in their emails on the phone. Um, go ahead, Ms. LaFrance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This item is also timely because item 11A includes the EIM 410 2020, which is the recommendation of award to Stantec for this RFP. And so this resolution, essentially, since it's been a while since we have dealt with the stormwater utility, although we were updated in um, a work session and a committee meeting. It recaps what's transpired so far and then identifies two actions in section one and section two um, to take before award of the contract and then another um, action for regular engagement with the commission throughout the contract term. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Seeing no discussion, members may proceed to vote to lay this item on the table. Ms. Kennedy. Yes. Mr. Peterson. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. That motion passes 11 to 0, so that item is laid on the table. Um, with that, we're going to go ahead and go back to um, the Assembly Chair's report, and we're going to call uh, Ms. Nordland. your pin to join this conference. Please enter your pin to join this conference. Do you have the pin, you have the pin number?
enter your PIN to join this conference. Welcome to Uber Conference by Dialpad. Joining conference now. This conference is being recorded by the <clears throat> Hi, Ms. Nordland. Hi, this is Felix Averia with the Anchorage Assembly. Uh, I've set your time for five minutes and looking forward to hearing about the youth employment in parks. Okay, great. I have um, welcome to the 14th summer of youth employment in parks with the Anchorage Park Foundation and Anchorage Parks and Recreation. This has been an interesting summer program. Um, we, we started with a small smaller crew of returners and crew leaders um, in, in early June, of course, during COVID-19, and we put procedures in place to be very safe in the workplace, and we um, started the full crew. Um, it's a five-week program this summer, so we started the full crews after July 4th, and they've been working on the a Government Hill Bluff Trail, Far North Bicentennial Park, um, Tour of Anchorage Trail, and um, the Rabbit Creek Park Trail, which is a connection of the Rabbit Creek Elementary School um, to the trail system. So they have um, had an interesting summer so far. Um, it's coming to an end soon. And thank you for making the time to talk with us um, we have two senior crew members with us today, Emily and Amaya, and the, the field educator, Meredith, is also on the phone. So let me um, have Emily introduce herself right now and maybe say a few words. Hi, uh, my name is Emily. I'm one of the senior crew members for YEP this year. Um, this year has been really different due to COVID, but I think... Um, Youth Employment and Parks and everyone involved handled it really well. Everyone's been great about wearing their masks and keeping their distance. So it's nice that, you know, we're working in a safe environment. And then all the projects have been super fun. Um, we started out by just pulling trees from a fuel break um, down far north by Centennial and uh, going and planting them along Campbell Creek. And then um, we also built a neighborhood trail over at um, Rabbit Creek, and that was very fun. It was nice because you know the community is going to use that trail. We received a lot of um, support from the community in Rabbit Creek, and then currently uh, working on the tour of Anchorage, it's uh, it's been a lot of hard work. We've had some really warm, sunny days. Um, moving gravel over a two-mile stretch is a it's a good amount of work, but also it's you know very nice. And again, the community, um, all the bikers and runners and walkers have been very supportive of Yes. And I'm just so glad that I got to come back this year and be a part of the amazing program of um, Yep's amazing program for two years in a row. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Amaya. I believe she has some things to say. Hello, my name is Amaya Crane, and I'm from District 23. And our project that we did this year was the Rabbit Creek Trail. And the reason why we did that one was to reroute the trail so that it's away from the neighbor's fence line. And we did the. We are doing right now the tour of Anchorage Trail, which is to improve the experience for runners when they're doing their marathons. We're adding gravel to a big stretch of that. And I think Yep is important because it builds community, gets people outside, and helps people enjoy their favorite trails. And I'm going to pass it over to Meredith. Hi, my name is Meredith Gutierrez, and I'm the field educator for YEP, and I'm also the schools on trail coordinator for the Anchorage Park Foundation. Um, and I'd just like to uh, bring attention to the fact that even though this summer has had many teens this summer who don't know the difference because this is their first year, um, tell us many of the things that we hear year after year about what an amazing program this is, the, the new people that they've met, the work that they've done, and how they feel um, lucky to have been a part of it, and many are looking forward to coming back next summer. Um, and so with the adaptations, we, we are still able to 
be outside and make a difference. And um, it's we feel lucky to be able to do that this summer. Um, and we hope, as the Park Foundation, we hope to transfer this over into school and parent program as well and encouraging teachers to take their students outside as a safe way to gather um, with safety adaptations. Um, even though it, it can look different, um, it can still be impactful and still be uh, a great program. That was perfect. Thank you so much, Meredith. And I guess I would like to add Felix for your information. I know you'll uh, actually, uh, I apologize. Ms. Nordland, but we are out of time, and uh, I'm gonna see if we have any questions in the queue. Uh, doesn't look like we do. Uh, Mr. Dunbar? Sorry, I, I, as a board member, I feel compelled to ask. Uh, Ms. Nordland, did you have some concluding remark you just wanted to make? Very short, hopefully. Yes, I just wanted to let you know that the work we're doing on the Tour of Anchorage Trail is serving as a big match for a federal grant and the work that we completed on the Rabbit Creek Park Trail is part of the challenge grant program. So we're um, picking all kinds of boxes by doing great work in our community this summer. Thank you, Ms. Nordland, and thank you to all the people that make YEP possible. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Ms. Nordland, and to everyone else uh, for the presentation. Um, with that, we're going to move on to the addendum to the agenda. Uh, Madam Vice Chair? Move to incorporate the addendum and lay it on the table items as printed, distributed, and read by you. Second. Moved and seconded by Ms. LaFrance. Um, any opposition to the motion to incorporate? Seeing none, those items are incorporated into the agenda. Um, then. Uh, Moving on to appearance requests and initial audience participation. Um, so we have two uh, initial appearance requests. We have uh, Reverend Dr. William Green. Oh, Hi, um, Dr. Green, this is Felix Rivera. You are with the Anchorage Assembly. Um, we are at initial appearance requests. Um, you have three minutes. Welcome. Three minutes? E yes, Dr. Green. Yes. You want me to get started? Go ahead. Are you ready for me now? Yes, we are, Dr. Green. Go ahead. Well, good afternoon. My name is Reverend Dr. William Green, and I am the chair of the Anchorage uh, Community Police Relation Task Force. And I would just say that uh, it has been a pleasure and a blessing for me to be the chair, and the task force has done an outstanding job for the Anchorage community. And one of the things I have proud in saying and I take pride in knowing that this task force has made a difference in Anchorage, Alaska. For instance, you don't see what's happening in the other 49 states happening in Anchorage, Alaska. And I challenge everyone on that. All right? This task force has been uh, a tremendous asset, and they have been a uh, uh, lot of changes in APD. Our police department, uh, you don't see what's going on in most police department because uh, they, I think, uh, uh, treat the community in an outstanding manner. There's always time and room for changes. However, I think we have been consistent in our communication with the community and with the police department. And I challenge that with anyone. And I debate that with anyone. 
throughout the other four United States. I think the only thing we have to look at what happened here in Lincoln, Alaska, and the task force has made a difference. And I have still any question anyone might have any time. And so my thing is, I don't think that we can come up with any other committee that has equal to the task force. I take pride in the task force. And anchors can take pride in the task force. All right? Now, we do need some changes. And I, I, I chair the, we look at the Constitution bylaw, and the only change I can see that we should make in that is change the date or review. Everything is, 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 is uh, right on time, and uh, everything has been to make the anxious community better. And I challenge anyone to that statement. They don't want to care to debate this doctor on the work of the task force and the difference the task force has made. We are available. And tonight, uh, we're supposed to have our executive committee, which is Pastor Marburg. And, uh, Apologies, uh, Dr. Green, um, but your time is up. Um, we do have uh, Pastor, Mar Pastor Marbury, who is going to be speaking soon. Okay, we can I get more time? My life. Time goes fast. And I really can't get everything in that I would like to get in. I think, well, my time is up. I won't go long. Thank you, thank Dr. You Green. Uh, allow me the time. And I will say this in conclusion. I'll debate anyone in Alaska or in the 50 states. Apologies, Dr. Oh, Green, but we, we have to move on. But thank you so much uh, for your service to our community. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Ms. Allison Mall. Ms. Mall? Yes. Hi, is this Ms. Mall? Yes, it is. Hi, this is Felix Rivera. You're with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on audio, um, appearance requests. Uh, you have three minutes. Welcome. Okay, thanks. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today I'm speaking um, up to recognize the many individuals in our community who are excited about and suited to be law enforcement officers. As a public school educator, I understand the desire to shift resources away from prisons and punishment and towards healing and opportunity. However, I'm here because I fundamentally oppose and without reservation the hashtag defund police initiative. I opposed it on May 30th, 2020, when the message strategically went up on the Black Lives Matter website, surprising the majority of its supporters, and I stand opposed to it today, even with um, the July 6, 2020 clarification. I was raised in Chibiac, and so I've had many opportunities uh, to observe police attitudes and oversteps occasionally. After all, we have a lot of no trespassing signs in my hometown. Later, my 28-year residency in Mountain View, combined with my um, profession as a public school educator, have uh, further shaped my view toward policing as a profession. Looking back at my residential and professional experience, I've observed more than 400 interactions with law enforcement agents. I've seen our LEAs protect people and property and act with integrity and justice, irrespective of ethnicity or age. They have employed the highest ethical standards, demanding accountability, consistency, fairness, and honesty in the performance of their duties. They have been valuable, valuable partners uh, with me as an educator, um, which brings me to my point, uh, the importance of disposition in the uh, policing profession. Um, we can focus on beliefs and skills, but these do not matter if an individual's different qualities of mind and character are not what we are looking for in our police and teachers. The mission of Alaska Police uh, Standards Council states it thusly, 
quote, to produce and maintain a highly trained and positively motivated professional capable of meeting contemporary law enforcement standards of performance. In other words, if a potential police officer has a cruddy or even criminal attitude, we certainly don't want um, that person serving our community. This position and attitude is surprisingly simple to observe and measure. You can screen for it during an interview, and it can even be fostered um, along something called the affective domain uh, continuum. Um, two simple examples uh, where I've observed this position. Uh, around 2006, there was a now demolished triplex on the corner of Price and Peterkin that my neighbors and I had become increasingly frustrated with. Uh, we couldn't get the landlord to address the issues, so we finally had to call the police. A uh, rookie cop showed up, and quite frankly, he had a bit of an attitude towards uh, the problem and us. And it was a pretty extreme problem at that residence. Um, almost like he looked down on Mountain View residents. Needless to say, it didn't sit well with me. The next day, I called to discuss my concerns. Um, I didn't want the rookie cop to get in trouble, per se, but I did want him to be coached up as a professional. Um, my second example relates to a comment that the mayor made. Uh, during his Apologies, uh, Ms. Small, but you are okay. out of time. Okay. Um, uh, so if really you'd like to email us help. the rest of I your uh, testimony, please feel free. I will um, do that. Um, it's really short. Basically, um, I'm sure the Muni has already been ahead of this defund the police initiative, but please continue to stay ahead of it so that our communities don't turn into the failed cities like some in the lower 48 being um, managed by incompetent men. Thank you, Ms. Small. Civilized society should have law and order and consequences. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Um, so the last um, individual that we will call for this uh, appearance request and initial audience participation is Pastor Marbury. Hi, Pastor Marbury. This is Felix Rivera with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on uh, initial audience participation. Um, we heard earlier from Reverend Dr. William Green. Uh, you have three minutes. Welcome. Okay. Um, and the subject would be about uh, the Anchorage Community Police Relations Task Force and what uh, the assembly be doing to support it. And that's what the members are concerned about. And we're looking at various cases uh, that are going on in the city with the community, and we're looking to help them uh, understand uh, police policies and procedures and, and some of the events that have taken place already. Um, as far as um, uh, the other task force that's been formed, uh, we're looking at our task force where the Equal Rights Commission withdrew themselves from being administrators for us and left us in a position uh, where we do need uh, an, an administration uh, policy and procedures uh, or uh, organization to back us up. So, um, well, uh, so we're just looking to see where uh, we stand with the assembly and what the assembly can do to support us in our efforts to evaluate what we can do for the community. And we already have quite a few members of the task force, and um, I'm in the process of uh, going back and reviewing with some of the Justice Department as far as them coming back to the table, uh, either with Zoom or or in person at the Fairview Rec Center where we are limited to just 20 people, okay? So I just talked with the, the U.S. attorney, and we have someone sitting at the table, uh, coming to the table from them, but uh, we still uh, look at where we are from, and we're from a strong foundation where we're backed by uh, Judge Timothy Burgess, 
where we were going to have a forum where he would be present on the table along with APD and, and the citizens, of course. And by this time, uh, we had the COVID epidemic present us, and um, so it kind of pushed that part of the um, program that we were looking forward to having as far as educating the community. So we have other different forms where uh, APD has uh, uh, some courses where uh, they call it policing one-on-one, uh, how, to, how to react when a police officer stops you, and, and uh, some, some basic things that um, the community has been involved with. Uh, the community was confused about the stand your ground ordinance that they have in the past. So a lot of things with active shooting, stand your ground, and, and other things that are constantly happening in our community, the people feel kind of left out vulnerable where these uh, events can overrun our schools. And our I apologize, Pastor Marbury, but you are out of time. Okay. Well, no problem. So we we look at the answers. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Moving on, we are now at the consent agenda. Consent agenda items number 10A through 10F are typically routine or non-controversial items such as bid awards, new business, information and reports, and ordinances and resolutions for introduction. The items on the consent agenda may be approved by the assembly by a single vote on a motion to approve the consent agenda. Prior to approval, items may be pulled by an assembly member for discussion and separate vote on each of those items. Under the assembly rules of procedure, all ordinances and some resolutions will have an opportunity for public hearing on a future date. With that, we're gonna go down the dais and see what folks have to pull. I'm gonna start on the other side with Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to pull items 10A8 for reading and also item 10F5 and 10F6. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to pull item 10 Delta 8 and I'd like to pull 10 Echo 5 uh, 10 Fox Trot 4, and I think I've got one other. Um, actually, I think Mr. Dunbar pulled uh, 10 F8 already, so um, it's not 10 Fox Trot 8, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Mr. Peterson. Mr. Peterson, do you have any items? No items this evening. Oh, thank you. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, 10B3, 10B4, and 10E8. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. LaFrance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No items to pull tonight. Thank you. Mr. Constant. The same. Thank you. Ms. Allard. Yes, Chair. Let me see here. Sorry, just one second. Sure. Good. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Perez Verdia. No items. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Ms. Zolotel. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. 10A9 for reading. And I believe that's it. Um, I think everything else was pulled. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Weddleton. Checking to see if there's anything left. <laughs> uh, nothing. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. All right. Let me go through the list. Let me know if I missed anything. So I have 10A, 8, and 9. I have 10B, 3, and 4. I have 10D, 8. I have 10E, 5, and 8. 
and I have 10, F, 4, 5, 6, and 8. Are there any other items? Okay, hearing none, Madam Vice Chair. Mr. Chair. Oh, yes, Ms. Kennedy. Thank you. Um, I don't have the actual numbers, so I just wanted to check on the late on the table item on the eviction. Uh, is that one pulled? Uh, no, that one was not pulled. Let me just double check. Uh, okay, I don't remember the number on it, but I would like to pull it. Sure, we can do that. Thank you. Looks like it's 10B5. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, hearing nothing else, uh, Madam Vice Chair? Move to adopt the consent agenda with the exception of the pulled item. Second. Okay. Um, thank you, and I just want to clarify that you meant approve. Uh, Madam Vice Chair? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Just want to clarify that you meant approve. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so that was moved and seconded. Any opposition? Seeing none, then that motion is approved. Uh, so for the public's information, the Assembly has now passed or accepted all items in 10A through 10E other than the items that were just pulled, which we will take up next, or that have been introduced for a future public hearing, which are all the items in 10G. If you're, uh, next, we're gonna go ahead and go through each of those items, starting with 10A8, just give me a second. AR number 2020-257, a resolution of the Municipality of Anchorage recognizing July 26, 2020 as the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. What is the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Any opposition? Seeing none, that is approved. Who's reading? I am reading, Mr. Chair. All right. A resolution of the Municipality of Anchorage recognizing July 26, 2020 is the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Whereas on July 26, 1990, President H.W. Bush signed into law the Americans with Disabilities Act, establishing a clear and comprehensive national mandate for the elimination of discrimination against people with disabilities. And whereas on September 25, 2008, the Americans with Disabilities Act Amendment Act uh, ADAAA was passed to fulfill the legacy of guaranteeing civil rights to persons with disabilities. And whereas one in four Americans living with a disability have expanded opportunities due to the ADA, reducing barriers, changing perceptions, and increasing full participation in the community. And whereas Miss Patty of Anchorage affirms the principles of equality and inclusion for persons with disabilities as embodied in the ADA, Alaska statutes, and Title V of the Anchorage Municipal Code. And where Whereas numerous organizations in Anchorage and Alaska, including the Equal Rights Commission and the ADA Advisory Commission, work in our community to bring forth the promise of equality and inclusion for persons with disabilities that was envisioned with the passage of the ADA. Now, therefore, the Anchorage Municipal Assembly resolves that July 26, 2020, is recognized as the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act and does hereby reaffirm to continue to work towards full ADA compliance. Pass and approved by the Anchorage Assembly this 28th day of July, 2020. Ms. Zolotel. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so this resolution is really important to me. Um, I have built my entire legal career pretty much around the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, and it is a large part of what brought me to Alaska in 2005. So um, I just wanted to acknowledge that, and uh, it, it's never caught on that it was the ADAAA. Um, <laughs> it's just the ADA. We just kept on going. So um, I'm really, um, I've been really happy with the work the municipality has done towards inclusion. 
um, and keeping it at the forefront, and I hope it continues. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Um, with that, the next item we have before us is Resolution AR number 2020-272, a resolution of the Anchorage Assembly honoring and recognizing the late Congressman John Lewis and his legacy. What is the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Any opposition? Seeing none, that uh, this item is approved. Who's reading? I am, Mr. Chair. Okay. A resolution of the Anchorage Assembly honor honoring and recognizing the late Congressman John Lewis and his legacy. Whereas Congressman John Lewis was born on February 21, 1940 in Troy, Alabama, the third of 10 children born to Willie May, Nay Carter, and Edie, or Eddie Lewis who were sharecroppers. And whereas John Lewis attended segregated schools in Pike County, Alabama, going on to earn a Bachelor's of Arts degree in Religion and Philosophy from Fisk University, then graduated from the American Baptist Theological Sem Seminary and was awarded over 50 honorary degrees from prestigious colleges and universities throughout the country, including Spelman College, Princeton University, University of New Hampshire, Johnson C. Smith University, Delaware State University, Duke University, Morehouse College, Clark Atlanta University, Howard University, Brandeis University, Columbia University, Fisk University, Williams College, Georgetown University, and Troy State University. And whereas John Lewis's dedication to his values and the work of the movement even led him to Anchorage, Alaska to deliver the keynote address at the Anchorage NAACP's 51st annual Freedom Fund, Freedom Fund Dinner in 2002, and whereas known as the youngest of the big six leaders in the civil rights movement, John Lewis dedicated his life to protecting human rights, securing civil liberties, and building what he calls the beloved community in America. And whereas as the chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, during the height of the civil rights movement, John Lewis and his philosophy of quiet strength endured more than 40 arrests, physical beatings, and serious injuries as he boldly challenged the deplorable Jim Crow system by organizing sit-in demonstrations at segregated lunch counters in Nashville, risked his life in the Freedom Rides, organized and spoke at the historic March on, March on Washington in August of 1963, organized and coordinated voter registration drives and community action programs during the Mississippi Freedom Summer, and led 600 peaceful orderly protesters across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama during what became known as Bloody Sunday. And whereas after leaving SNCC in 1966, John Lewis remained in the vanguard of progressive social movements and human rights struggles as an associate director of the Field Foundation and director of the Voter Education Project, and in 1977, was appointed by President Jimmy Carter to direct more than 250,000 volunteers of the Federal Volunteer Agency. And whereas, having inspired freedom-loving people throughout the land, this intrepid individual took his tremendous talents and noble ideas into public office and won elections to the Atlanta City Council in 1981 and the United States House of Representatives in 1986. And whereas John Lewis received a plethora of accolades through his extraordinary life, including the Lincoln Medal, of, including the Lincoln Medal from the historic Fred Ford's Theater and the Golden Plate Award, the Academy of Excellence, and the Preservation Hero Award from the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the Capital Award from the National Council of La Raza, the Martin Luther King Jr. Nonviolent Peace Prize, the President's Medal from Georgetown University, the NAACP Spingarn Medal, the National Education Association Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Award, and the only John F. Kennedy Profile and Courage Award for Lifetime Achievement ever granted by the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. And whereas throughout his long and distinguished career as a public servant, John Lewis worked tirelessly on behalf of his constituents and all Americans, bringing his office an honorable bearing and the time-honored values of hard work and common sense. And whereas a catalyst for positive change who helped this great nation mature into an even more just and equitable democracy, 
John Lewis epitomized the ideal of the consummate professional, dedicated public servant, and true American hero. And the Timberland Company established the John Lewis Award and the John Lewis Scholarship Fund in honor of his unparalleled commitment to humanitarian service. And whereas Congressman Lewis was a venerable person who evinced the greatest integrity and probity in all his chosen endeavors, and whereas Congressman Lewis distinguished himself as a public-spirited citizen of the highest order and as an exceptional asset to the citizens of Georgia's 5th Cor Congressional District, who evinced their firm belief in Congressman Lewis's abilities as a legislator by electing him to serve as their representative since 1986. And whereas, known as the conscience of the United States Congress, John Lewis's devotion to the highest ethical standards and moral principles earned him the respect and admiration of his constituents and colleagues on both sides of the aisle. And whereas, the passing of Congressman John Lewis is a sorrowful loss for this great nation. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Anchorage Assembly, Municipal Assembly hereby honors Congressman John Lewis and his life of great achievement for the advancement of liberty in America and recognizes his lifetime of making good trouble, necessary trouble, and painstaking dedication to creating a more fair, more just society. Passed and approved by the Anchorage Assembly on this 28th day of July, 2020. Mr. Rivera. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Good job. I want to read an excerpt from a speech which uh, Congressman uh, John Lewis gave uh, at the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. 50 years later, we can ride anywhere we want to ride. We can stay where we want to stay. Those signs that said white and colored are gone, and you won't see them anymore, except in a museum, in a book, on a video. But there are still invisible signs buried in the hearts in humankind that form a gulf between us. Too many of us still believe our differences define us instead of the divine spark that runs through all of human creation. The scars and stains of racism still remain deeply embedded in American society, whether it is stop and frisk in New York or injustice in Trayvon Martin case in Florida, the mass incarceration of millions of Americans, immigrants hiding in fear in the shadow of our society, unemployment, homelessness, poverty, hunger, or the renewed struggle for voting rights. I say to each of us today, we must never, ever give up. We must never give in. We must keep the faith and keep our eyes on the prize. Congressman Lewis, you've crossed your last bridge. You've left the world a better place. You've taught us how to fight on, to stand up for what's right, to speak up, to get in good trouble. We shall overcome one day, thanks to you. Thank you, Mr. Rivera. With that, the next item we have is 10B3, AR number 2020-266, a resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly urging the University of Alaska Board of Regents to restore a, society, a sociology program at the University of Alaska Anchorage. What is the role of the body? Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, Ms. Quinn Davidson, you pulled this item? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just hadn't, you know, seen this until recently and don't really understand the broader context of all of the different departments and what's going on at UAA. So I was hoping Ms. Zalatel could speak a little bit to the resolution. Ms. Zalatel? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Ms. Quinn Davidson, for the um, request. Um, as many have probably seen in the various 
restructurings happening in the university system and the University of Alaska in particular, um, the sociology department um, didn't make the last round of restructuring and it's more pertinent than ever to have the resources of a sociology department available to us as policymakers, to businesses, to all of us who are engaged in work t toward equity, quite frankly. Um, we, when we reached out to the sociology department um, or spoke with them, it was really interesting that a lot of students don't necessarily start as sociology majors, but as they dig into these issues that mean the most to them, whether they're around race or um, women's studies or, or things like that, they learn that sociology is the thing that they've really been wanting to study and know more about. Um, and so they have a lot of folks who change their major to sociology and then go on to really um, help inform our ideas and thoughts around so much of kind of what is really relevant to us um, today. So that's why this resolution is there. I, I think it's really important that we su support this department um, and, and keep it available as a resource to us um, and the municipality and for all of Anchorage. Anything else, Ms. Quinn Davidson? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Ms. Altel, for the description. I'm completely supportive of everything you just described, but I feel a little bit uncomfortable without understanding the scope of cuts and the varying departments that are impacted, whether, I guess it just feels a little inappropriate for me to be weighing in without having more information about the various departments of the university, um, irrespective of the fact that I support everything you said. So I, I think I'm going to vote no, not, not because I don't support that content, but because I don't think I have enough information to weigh in at this point. Thank you. Mr. Weddleton? Well, thanks. Yeah, it seems like um, with the issues we have, uh, there would be a lot of work for people like this. Um, I think a couple questions. Um, uh, for Meg, I guess. Um, do you know why UAA would cancel it? And, and then um, because it's a program is canceled, does that mean that there will be no teachers of sociology classes, you know, for kind of general requirements and so on? So I guess what I would like to do, Mr. Chair, I mean, to, if we want to get into um, kind of the machinations of the university is we have um, Nelta Edwards available by phone. Um, so I would like the opportunity to phone a friend. Sure. Um, and I have that number. Let me jot it down and provide it to Travis. Great. Hi, this is Felix Rivera. You're with the Anchorage Assembly. Uh, we are currently Felix. on the resolution regarding the sociology program at UAA, and um, yes. I think we have a couple of questions for you. I'll turn to Ms. Altel if you want to restate them. Um, good evening, Ms. Edwards. Um, actually, um, Mr. Weddleton had some questions, so I'm just going to let him restate his questions What's to you directly so I don't possibly misstate them. Sure. Just a moment. Certainly. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay, so um, why did they cancel the sociology program? And then question two is if the program is canceled, does that mean there's no one to teach any sociology class for anyone? Well, what is the reason that they canceled it is they cut a number of programs because of budget issues. So um, the sociology program has about 50 majors right now and 30 minors. So it was strictly because of budgets. We do a really great job. We're a small department, um, but we do a really good job. Now, um, because of federal laws, they can't immediately eliminate a major, right? That would be like a bait and switch to students. And so they have to uh, make a plan to teach out the students who are in the major right now. 
So that would take anywhere from two to four years. But after those two to four years are over, um, they would probably only keep one person to teach introduction to sociology um, because um, several of the majors use that as um, for their students for part of their major. Um, but there wouldn't be any upper division sociology classes to take, and of course there wouldn't be a major. So this would make Alaska the only state and, and among many of the U.S. territories as well without a sociology major. All right, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so just a, a quick comment um, from me, and then there are a couple other folks in the queue who may have questions for you, um, so I would stay on the line. Um, but from, for my part, um, you know, I think if, if we're going to be uh, serious as a society about combating a lot of the different issues that we are talking about on a regular basis, and um, then I think this program must be reinstated. And I think it's appropriate for us to send that message to the Board of Regents, who in the end are the ultimate deciders. Um, with that, sorry for not turning it over. Uh, with that, I have Mr. Perez Verdia. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, just wanted to share a, a brief comment. Um, I mean, I, I, I can't imagine anyone is against um, this department in the university and a vote um, against this certainly wouldn't be, um, hopefully wouldn't be interpreted as, as against that. I, I'm going to vote no on it just because I'm not a fan of these kinds of re re resolutions. I, I really do feel like that it's an overstep for us to, to recommend what the university should do in terms of managing their, their budget and singling out one department over another. I, I just don't, don't think it's a very good practice for us. And so I'm I'm going to vote no on it because um, I, I don't really um, I, I don't really like this sort of action um, as it relates to this this body, and I think that we need to be very cautious about um, advising other bodies on decisions related to their organizations and their budgets. So um, just want to share that, and and I appreciate it being brought brought forward, but I'm I'm a no vote on this. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Allard. Thank you. I agree with um, Cameron in regards to this particular resolution. I think it's an overstep of the assembly and to put pressure on what the Board of Regents has already decided, I think it's outside of our scope. That's it. I'll be a no vote too. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. Ms. Kennedy. No. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. I'm actually unable to hear except for on the live stream, so I'm watching and I'm a little delayed. So maybe you could come back to me. It has already Mr. Perez Verdia? No. Yeah. Ms. Quinn Davidson? I don't know. No. That motion passes six to five. Next, we have item 10B4, a resolution of the Anchorage Assembly for a fourth extension of the proclamation of civil emergency issued by the mayor of the municipality of Anchorage on March 12th, 2020. What is the will of the body? Moved to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. I believe we have an amendment on this item. Yes. Chair, I'd like to move floor amendment. Um, it's not numbered, but for 10B4. Second. Amendment number, no, number one and two, sorry. Number one, two, and three, all on the same page. Thank you. Um, does the administration want to speak to this amendment? Ms. Vogel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is uh, an update to the 
uh, resolution on uh, extending the proclamation of civil emergency. Uh, we like to have it as up to date as possible because it's a document that's dated today. Um, and that means that uh, uh, we got this together for the addendum, uh, which was Friday, um, and drafted it last week. Uh, but since then, the numbers of people who have been uh, confirmed to have come down with COVID-19 has increased uh, significantly. The number of Alaskans who have uh, been confirmed with cases of COVID-19 has increased. Um, you can see on July 22nd, the last time the dates were polled, uh, we were looking at um, uh, 2,132 cases uh, in Alaska, and that number is now 2,729. Uh, and that's not counting the visitors. It used to be 484. This amendment would note that as of today, it's reported at 621 among visitors. Um, and the virus uh, was responsible for the deaths of 19 Alaskans last week when this was drafted. That number is now 22. Um, so this just updates it to reflect uh, the reality as uh, uh, presented today. Thank you. Seeing no discussion on the amendment, members may proceed to vote. Ms. Kennedy. Yes. Mr. Peterson. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson? Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia? Yes. That motion uh, amendment passes 10 to 1. We now have the main motion before us. Ms. Zolotel? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question, a couple of questions, actually, for the administration. Um, First, I notice this is an extension through October 2nd, 2020. So I'd like to hear a little bit about that. And then I would like to know what, if any, plans the administration has to flatten the curve again. Um, it's on an upward trend that is alarming, concerning, um, and quite frankly, um, I'm hearing from some really stressed out parents <laughs> Um, they're drowning. They can't keep up one way or the other, whether they have to go to work or not. So I'd like to hear a little bit about what is the intention um, to do uh, anything about that in the uh, immediate term um, and moving toward this October deadline that's placed in here. Thank you. Through the chair, uh, Assembly Member uh, Zalatel, this is Jason Bockenstead. Um, I, I'll answer your question. Um, uh, second question first, which is to say, uh, as I think the, the mayor has um, previously stated um, at last week's community briefing and uh, at the beginning of this week, that at this point, all options are on the table for us to consider how do we go about flattening the curve. I will say that the first step that has been taken is um, emergency order 14 that went into effect Friday morning at 8 a.m. And a couple of the large aspects of that um, include uh, reducing the capacity in restaurants and uh, a number of other areas to 50% and reducing capacity at bars to 25% and um, looking it up, um, uh, including uh, indoor gyms, bingo halls, theaters, and other recreation and entertainment facilities. They were also reduced to 50%. Um, and that uh, legible visitor logs are required at all of these facilities that have um, individuals that uh, are required to sit for longer than 15 minutes um, so that uh, if there are cases that are traced to there, we can track them and, and go through our contact tracing um, uh, requirements uh, that we do. Um, and then the final piece was also um, a requirement that uh, at hotels, um, if there are COVID-positive patients there, 
the general manager or the owners of the hotel are required to tell uh, the workers um, that there are COVID positive uh, patients at the, at the hotel. So that is the first step that we are taking to uh, flatten the curve. And um, we will certainly be uh, looking at um, additional measures if the numbers do not start uh, reversing in the very near term. Because I think, as you mentioned, all of us have um, a desire um, with the school year coming up to figure out how can we um, safely begin uh, uh, getting the schools open. But I think as the school district and I think everyone has looked at the numbers, uh, the way that it's currently going, that is not going to be possible. And I think the school district has already uh, mentioned and notified everyone that online instruction is going to happen. And uh, that is going to provide or portend uh, other issues that are going to come up because as the school year begins, there are a lot of families and individuals that have both parents working in them and all of a sudden there are going to be kids that um, are supposed to be at home doing schoolwork and how are the, the parents going to be able to uh, stay home and not go to work. I will certainly say that we are spending a lot of time looking at those issues um, for all of the employees within the municipality and have really started that process of trying to figure out what type of accommodations that we can work through to uh, hopefully lessen that impact. But certainly um, one of the reasons why we are asking for the extension through October 2nd is to also kind of see how does the first couple of weeks of the school year uh, look and what types of other things might we have to do um, to to help with that aspect of it. But certainly, um, uh, the the number one priority that we are going to have is really flattening the curve over the next couple of weeks. So with that, I will let either uh, Kate or the mayor um, also provide any additional comments that I might have missed or Bill. To the chair, uh, I will also add that to the extent that we need the community to do some things, there are also the core governmental responses that we're keeping our eyes on. So behind the curtain, we are always now laser focused on the testing, the tracing, and the monitoring. Folks are keenly aware that we have been somewhat swamped on those fronts, but we are looking to step up the capacity. And I can report that we'll have more details out to the community, that the municipality will be standing up five different testing centers across the municipality starting on Friday. We look to target those testing sites to communities that have had the lowest access to the healthcare system. We'll have details on where those are. We've been partnering with some faith-based organizations. I think that will be a good news story that will help alleviate uh, some of the concerns we saw even today where the Walgreens Lake Otis testing site was pretty overwhelmed with traffic today. Uh, so more testing will be coming online. It's an expensive endeavor. Uh, that shows up later in your agenda where you'll see that we're asking for more uh, authorization to spend on the COVID front, but a necessary one. Uh, meanwhile, on the tracing side, we have increased our sophistication on the tracing side. We've been working closely with the state to stand up a new uh, IT solution, a ComCare Demagi system, which should allow us to become more sophisticated in data sharing across our two platforms from the state and to the locality. Uh, and also entered into a partnership with UAA to do more genotyping of the different variants of the virus that we're seeing in the community so that we could potentially be savvier about the disease incidents as we are testing it, finding it out in the community itself. And then last on the monitoring side, we're looking to see if we can't just expand that capability. Uh, reinforcements are coming. We didn't want to stand up a parallel system for recruiting additional contact tracers and monitors because we thought there was a limited pool of people who could potentially do that in Alaska and UAA was the machine that was going to create them. So the state has taken the lead in standing up a contact tracing and monitoring program. We understand that they have hundreds of people who have been working in the wings, getting ready, getting tested, uh, uh, getting trained rather, and that their arrival is now imminent. So. Uh, in the same time that we are needing the community to help us, I think the last community update I gave, we had approximately 20 active cases in Anchorage. Today we have 1,020 cases in active in Anchorage. Uh, we are also working to improve our game behind the curtain. Thank you. Mr. Weddleton. Uh, thanks. Um, and you know, obviously this is very controversial and, and I think for any order that's gone out, there's many who think it's way, way too much and many others think it's not enough and some businesses ignore it or places ignore it and others 
take a more extreme reaction. And I think overall, I think the mayor has been fairly judicious in using the emergency powers, particularly I think a lot of things that we've approved, and I believe those purchases of those four buildings could have done largely under emergency powers, but we went through a process for that. Um, so I really appreciate that. So, um, and, and I will support this, but I do have a question. Were this to not pass, what kinds of things would stop or what, what, what would happen, good or bad, to whoever? Through the chair to Assemblymember Weddleton, I think two things would happen, and they largely track the internal operations and what we need of the community. So on the internal side, we have used the emergency proclamation to do the things that we listed in the memorandum as A through F. So we have decompressed the homeless shelters and are spending tremendous amounts of money keeping the Sullivan Arena in operations. We set up a system to move COVID positive and persons under investigations to their critical dialysis appointments and to their uh, testing appointments. We have gathered up personal protective equipment and distributed that personal protective equipment and cloth masks. We have augmented the health department's contact tracing and monitoring personnel and are giving them some additional resources. We're looking to get more affirmative communications out into the world. So we had a campaign about 4th of July. We had a campaign about dipnating. I think we're going to have more of those targeted communications going forward. And like I say now, we are about to get very much more fully in the game of broad sped mobile community testing and then targeted testing at critical infrastructure and sentinel sites so that we would be going to grocery stores and doing uh, voluntary um, testing just as a sentinel event. Without the emergency proclamation, I think we would be challenged on a whole variety of fronts. We, to accomplish that, we have repurposed a lot of people from their day jobs. So we have had fire battalion chiefs, librarians, parks and recreation employees, lifeguards who are, are manning the station, staffing the stations at the emergency operations center. Increasingly, as that has become less sustainable, we've been backfilling with contract support. But we've been using the emergency proclamation's ability to repurpose individuals and municipal resources to accomplish all that work. So that's one thing that it has allowed. Of course, the other is all of the orders that you see that are referenced in the other resolution. Uh, in the absence of an emergency proclamation, we would not have a masking order. We would not have uh, the ability to order those kinds of uh, public uh, uh, efforts that we need uh, the community to help us with to really reduce the transmission rates. All right, thank you. Can I, one, one quick one. So, um, so we're doing more testing. How quick are results coming back? We're, we're trying to get a better handle on that. The tests go to various locations. Some tests go to the state lab, and a lot of tests are now going out of state. The airport tests, I think, are sent to California daily. I can tell you in my own personal experience, I went through the Walgreens drive through last week, and it took me three and a half days to get testing results. I believe they came from the West Coast somewhere. It was not the state lab. The average that we're hearing from the state is somewhere between two and four days. We know that that's got to be a short window and for that to be useful to people, to make sure that people are actually going to seriously stay quarantined until they have their results, but also so we can do meaningful contact tracing and monitoring. When we stepped into the Lake Otis site, we more or less paid Providence to continue on with what they had set up. We don't have perfect visibility into the individual turnaround times for the test, but we are told it's somewhere on the order of three to four days. In our new arrangement, we made sure that that was one of the things that we wanted to know. We want Visit Health, the contractor who's going to be performing that, to give us better reporting on exactly how long those things are taking. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, I have Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Falsey, for, for that and for your efforts and for the whole team's efforts, particularly in these new testing sites. I'm hopeful that they will reach a community that thus far has not been able to access or has not accessed the testing facility um, as much as probably is appropriate. So I'm, I'm interested to see those results, and I appreciate what you are doing. My question is on... The, uh, so there's a lot of information presented here, and some of it was in the amendment you gave us, and some of it is in the existing AM. And on the last page of the AM, uh, there's a graph there that describes the model of where we will exceed our ICU capacity. And, you know, we've seen this huge increase in cases, but I think we're just now starting to see a concomitant increase in hospitalizations and in deaths. Um, but this is from July 12th, and so I'm wondering if, first of all, is there any way from the health department online or available to answer questions? Uh, yeah, this is Natasha. I'm online. 
Thank you, Ms. Pineda. And I was wondering if you had, so here it says, uh, if I'm reading this right, yes, uh, ICU capacity is predicted to be exceeded on September 22nd. And that's, uh, I think, I believe, assuming a R naught of 1.3. I'm wondering if you have any update uh, on what the R naught is and or when we think we might exceed our ICU capacity if we do not flatten the curve. I can um, share with you, but also um, Mr. Falzi probably has this report with him as well, so I'm just going to pull it up. We did get an update um, on that model today, and um, the bottom line of the brief, which I'm sure will be sold to you, um, is that the ICU capacity is, ex is expected to be exceeded I mean, approximately eight weeks. So I think they updated it to... Um, hold on, I just want to get the date exactly right, September 17th. So it's, it has moved up um, to September 17th, and I believe the R, the RT is is now at 1.3, Okay. which is, I think, maybe the same as the July 12th one. But Yes, it is. Thank you, Ms. Pineda. So I think as we think about voting on this, we should keep that in mind. The... Uh, Right now, we're seeing an increase in cases, but if we do not take action, if we do not empower the mayor to continue with these actions, uh, we will exceed our ICU capacity uh, in perhaps eight short weeks uh, and be in a much worse situation than we are now. So with that, I intend to support this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I had one more piece of information I neglected to share. Go ahead. Sure. I want to make sure that you all know that the models do not account for the potential impacts of patients that are transferred to Anchorage ICUs. Um, they also don't um, take care for any of the out-of-state numbers that are um, in Anchorage now. So eight weeks is the estimate. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have Ms. Kennedy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just kind of one point of interest. Um, I uh, flew back into Anchorage last week, Tuesday night at midnight to be exact, and uh, had a uh, COVID test taken at the airport. There was absolutely no waiting in line. There were six stations open, so um, they get people through pretty quickly. Um, and then I got my test results back by noon on Friday, so two and a half days. So that was a pretty quick turnaround. Uh, I went in today to get my second test, and... It was the um, same thing, six stations open. Uh, they were handling one person in front of me, one behind me. So it was basically a really quick thing. So um, I don't know. You know, I know they tell you that you're supposed to go to certain testing stations. But my question is, if we tell people that it is quicker to go to the airport, can we do that? And will they be tested, particularly if they're uh, getting their second test? And I don't know if anybody specifically knows that answer, but um, anyway, I just found the difference between what's going on at Lake Otis versus what's happening at the airport to be an incredibly stark difference. Uh, to the Chair to Assemblymember Kennedy, uh, I think the answer to the question is no, we're not directing folks back to the airport now. Uh, we have been working closely with the state who set up the testing at the airport with its contractors, uh, really sized for the airport traffic. Um, we could ask that question, although I think that there even in real time it has been some changes to that testing regime announced by the governor while we have been in uh, this meeting. I don't know if that has a, a direct impact on the suggestion you're making. Uh, meanwhile, I think uh, our, our first suggestion would be um, to, to give us to Friday to see if we can't relieve the burden that is showing up at the Walgreens site and on the Lake Otis site that we're controlling by standing up these additional drive throughs I think that would be sort of the best answer rather than having more people push to the airport system. Well, I guess I can appreciate that, but at the same time, when we have services that are available, um, uh, it just seems to me that we ought to be able to kind of share some of the burden, so to speak, uh, rather than having to set up all new uh, systems and sites. Um, so anyway, I'll leave it at that. Um, but that leads me to uh, my next question, and that's just in regard to really what is the relationship between how the municipality is standing up these things versus the state? Is the state basically saying, Anchorage, you're big enough, you're on your own, 
or are we saying, no, we want to do this ourselves, so state, leave us alone? I mean, I'm really trying to get a handle on what the coordination type of relationship is between uh, the state and the municipality in regard to testing. Thanks. And through the chair to Assemblymember Kennedy, that's a great question. We are in close coordination and close communication. I'll say the lines of demarcation are perhaps not as bright as they could be. The way that the system has unfolded so far is that for the first several months, we were beg borrowing and stealing just to find testing supplies. And we really got to the place several times where we nearly overwhelmed the capacity of the state labs to process those tests. As soon as we got a signal that more lab capacity was available out of state that could rapidly turned around these tests and that contractors were now available who could show up with just the swabs, the vials, and the transport media, that's when we launched our procurement effort to stand up additional testing. Outside of Anchorage, the state has been a little bit more proactive in setting up uh, state-run testing sites, so in the Matsu Valley, for instance. I think that's in part because, uh, unlike Anchorage, they don't have a health department and they don't have health powers. Here in Anchorage, the state certainly helped facilitate some of the pop-up testing that happened in Eagle River. I think that was the Fred Meyer site that was set up in the church parking lot. Uh, and we have been sending all of the responses to our invitation to bid directly to the leads at the state to help uh, us be smart about uh, what we should be procuring and so that everyone has eyes on what we are doing. Uh, in, in the main, I think the state has taken on the airport testing because the airport is a state facility. Uh, we volunteered to take on Providence because uh, we as a municipality with health powers uh, felt an obligation to keep that, uh, that testing site going. Uh, and now we've stepped into the broad spread testing because we saw it as a need and we knew that we had the capacity that we could step in and fill it. I'm not sure there has been a satisfactory first principles philosophical division of labor where we said this is where the muni is operating and this is where the state's operating, but we've been figuring it out together. I think that's the best I can offer you now. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. On this question, Ms. Vogel? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, through the chair, Assembly Member Kennedy, um, uh, related to your question, although not directly um, within the four squares of how we're working with the state on uh, testing capacity, is some recent uh, statements by the Attorney General with respect to local authority on issuing orders. Uh, there's been an evolution, I would say, at, at the State Department of Law um, uh, about what local powers exist, and the latest um, messaging seems to be a recognition that one size does not fit all, and that local uh, governments, regardless uh, potentially of whether there are home rule municipalities like us um, uh, or not, have the power to issue emergency orders. That was a clarification, uh, and specifically emergency orders about masking, for example. And that was a clarification that followed news reports that several communities were declining to issue mask mandates based on the opinion that they lacked the authority to do so. So the latest messaging that we've been hearing on the legal end of things is um, a recognition that one size doesn't fit all and that uh, local government is empowered to issue emergency orders appropriate to their communities. Thank you. Mr. Constant? Yeah, thank you. Not intending to make too much light of a very complex and challenging situation for us all. There's one thing that Mr. Falsey left off to Mr. Wellington's question about what happens if this expires, the plastic bag ban goes back into effect. Thank you. Ms. Allard? Thank you. Um, in regards to the emergency order, I just wanted to clarify a few things. Um, I just wanted to clarify a few things, if you could please. If FEMA, with this emergency um, order powers, would not be affected, correct? We could still proceed with FEMA um, emergency um, dollars. That is my understanding, yes, that we okay. could still seek public assistance reimbursement from FEMA regardless of whether we have a local declaration. I'm not sure I've researched that all the way, but I believe that is correct. Okay. The other thing is, um, so we're not following the state's testing. We're doing our own testing, Mr. Falsey, as, as a municipality, meaning we're not um, under their guidance or could we be under their guidance? Can you clarify that for me? Uh, through the chair to Assemblymember Allard, 
I, I think it's fair to say that we are hand in glove with the state on testing and we are separately procuring testing capabilities, meaning that we created a testing strategy for Anchorage and we did that uh, in concert with the state division of epidemiology and with their experts. And then we operationalized it by saying that we're gonna go out and procure the services of a vendor that can stand up five different mobile testing sites and to, can go to our senior centers and can go to our grocery stores. Um, so I think we're all on the same page. I think we're all playing by the same rules. We just elected to pay the dollars to make it happen because we had the wherewithal and the, the person power to stand it up. Okay. I just have a couple more, if that's okay. So then um, as far as you, you stated day jobs, meaning um, it, this allows our mayor to um, move municipality employees around as needed. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to, correct? Uh, yes, uh, so the mayoral proclamation allows the mayor to move municipal resources around to places that haven't been budgeted and to reassign personnel. So we, like I say, we have people who are not doing their day jobs, who are reporting to the emergency operations center, who are lifeguards, who are instead now situation unit leaders. Uh, there are also some other minor things. We've negotiated with all of the unions that we can do teleworking to the maximum extent possible. Those agreements are all tied to the existence of the emergency. If the emergency were to disappear, we'd have to renegotiate amendments to the collective bargaining bargaining agreements, uh, those kinds of things. But yes, it gives more flexibility to move dollars and people around to the need. And then just one last clarification. With our CARE funds, just so the public understands, the CARE funds are not affected in our emergency proclamation. So we can still spend our CARES funds without this emergency proclamation? Through the Chair, does remember oh, that is correct? So we're pretty much doing the same thing as the state. So technically, we could put together a resolution for those things I just discussed with you and leave everything off the table as far as we could get a, not have the emergency proclamation and do a resolution that would enable our mayor to be able to do these things? I don't know if Ms. Vogel wants to answer that one. Yeah, through the, through the chair, um, Assembly Member Allard, no, that is uh, part of an emergency power. Uh, so you've got um, uh, union agreements that state what people's jobs are, uh, and it's, it's not just a matter of uh, passing a separate resolution that would um, authorize that. There's provisions within uh, the code that say, you know, here are the, the rules that you follow on procurement. The only exception on some of those is uh, under a declaration of emergency. So our code is set up to understand uh, that there are some rules that apply in an emergency. I, I don't believe that the assembly could effectuate that status um, without declaring an emergency or extending the emergency in this case. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Zolotel? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move the, uh, to amend on section one for the date um, to change that to Friday, October 16, 2020. Second. Moved and seconded. Do you want to speak to it? Um, yes, Mr. Chair. October 16 is a significant date because it's the end of the first quarter for the Anchorage School District. Um, I think it's important to align for planning purposes um, for so much of our community. Um, one of the options to parents right now is you could sign up to be in virtual school attached to your enrolled school. But if you do so, your next decision point is at the end of the quarter. Um, you don't just get to bounce back into your school. And so that timing, knowing what that enrollment is, will be really great data for the municipality as it considers what it's going to do next um, in October. Similarly, um, emergency orders tend to um, be issued or reissued or refined around the issuance of or extension of the emergency declaration. So it seems like a good idea to align these things for planning purposes. Um, and it's just, it's a natural time that an other decisions are going to be made. Thank you. Oh, Ms. sorry, before I forget, we have a meeting already that Tuesday before too, so it's not throwing us in any weird meeting schedule. Thank you. Mr. Constant? Yeah, thanks. I just, I won't make a motion, but I'm gonna suggest that we are gonna find ourselves doing this again at least until November the 15th when the state emergency is set to expire. Thank you. Ms. Allard? Thank you. I just want to make a quick statement. I think um, by us extending it to what Ms. Zolotel has suggested, we, we have extreme mental health issues with our children and our families. 
and I think that we should allow the schools to decide what's best for our kids. And even though there's some online homeschooling going on, that, that doesn't work for every family. And I really want the body to take into consideration. I'd rather, if the mayor is going to continue with his emergency, emergency powers and adjust as the curve goes down or gets lower, however we're, we're stating that, that I feel as a body we should be able to come back and reevaluate each time. It's this it, suicide rates have gone up. Last year we had 195 suicide rates in Ala or suicides in Alaska alone. That's an epidemic. So I find that this mental health, I've talked to families, friends, children, they're having a hard time. So I think we should, as a body, just keep, keep coming back and keep discussing it. That's what we should do. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote on the amendment. Ms. Kennedy. No. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. That amendment passes nine to two. Uh, we now have the main motion back before us. Ms. Kennedy. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I had a question uh, probably for Ms. Vogel. Uh, when we were talking about uh, how the emergency orders allow for contracts to basically be um, superseded by um, whatever emergency order uh, would be in, um, activated. And my question is, would, does the um, state declaration of emergency have any power over the contracts, or is it only the municipality that has any power over its contracts? And I, and I ask that question because I'm just, I'm also curious as to how other organizations, other um, cities and towns and boroughs uh, handle their contracts during this time. Uh, so anyway, the question is, um, it would not the uh, state actually give us authority uh, during a state declaration of emergency to alter or um, uh, adjust contracts? Thanks. Uh, through the chair, no, our charter lays out uh, the methodology for that and it requires a use of the emergency power by the mayor. It gives it to the mayor and, and that can only exist during a state of emergency. So. Um, with, our, uh, with various contracts, the state isn't a party to them, um, so their declaration of emergency, it, it just doesn't play that role. We've got, um, uh, we've got the provisions in code that say how to do it, and uh, they don't, they don't, they're not triggered by a state declaration of emergency. Well, that's something we might need to deal with at some point, but anyway, great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. Ms. Kennedy. No. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. That item passes nine to two. With that, we're gonna take a 20 minute break and when we come back, we'll be on item 10B5.
read it before uh, we actually voted on the consent agenda. Um, but looking through it, I think there are some good points here. Um, so um, I plan to support this. Um, I will say just kind of um, some additional information I've heard recently that we expect uh, about 25,000 jobs in the state of Alaska uh, to have literally been uh, lost and gone forever. Um, so uh, I think uh, this particular uh, resolution uh, could probably, uh, well, we'll speak, you know, obviously speaks to that problem as well, not to, not just to mention the fact that it mentions the 110,000 that found themselves out of work uh, at the beginning of this COVID thing. Um, but anyway, I think what I also appreciate is just kind of the inclusiveness of all the different entities that really need to be paying attention to this, including the public. Um, so um, I'll, um, uh, I'll support this. Uh, I particularly, um, well, I'm not particularly in favor of some of the other eviction ordinances or resolutions that we have, but this one uh, I can. So thank you. Thank you. Ms. Zelato? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Question for you as the sponsor. Do we know if the governor has the authority to issue an eviction moratorium? Thank you. So, yeah, this is something that um, I have asked uh, some members of the legislature. And um, I think the initial legal opinion is that, uh, yes, this is something that the governor could do, but I think there may be a variety of opinions on that. And I don't know if our legal team wants to respond to that either. Through the chair, I am just responding to say I haven't looked into it, so I, I can't offer a, a legal opinion on it. Um, also, I somehow don't have 10B5 in front of me, um, so I was wondering if someone could email it to me. Thank you. Uh, anything else, Ms. Solito? Okay, thanks. Mr. Rivera. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair. So, um, yeah, basically want to speak very quickly on the merits of this resolution. Um, so as members are aware earlier last week or so, um, uh, I emailed out uh, some work that was done by the National League of Cities, which uh, we uh, work with on a regular basis on a variety of different issues and they came up with this um, sort of six-point plan of different areas that um, cities can work on sort of overlaying with each other um, to uh, basically help hamper uh, this eviction tsunami that we expect to be coming and I think it of importance is um, particularly uh, the work that I have done with United Way uh, to uh, assist uh, in moving forward on some of these items, and I think particularly number six is an item that United Way is really ready and willing to assist in convening. And um, so just to note that there is a, a partner in the community that uh, I will be working on if this is passed, and I urge approval by my colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Rivera. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Weddleton. Thanks. <clears throat> so, so I'm sorry, I was a few steps late. So we came in, we moved and seconded in this, and now we're in discussion. Okay, I moved to um, delete page two, line five and six, um, the part that says allowing tenants to use their security deposit to pay off rent arrears. So it would end with um, past due rent period. Second. Do you want to speak to that? Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I mean, it's a tough thing to do at a um, eviction moratorium, you know, for, you know, landlords. Um, but, you know, if you are in a situation like we're in now, you would, you don't want to lose your tenant. I mean, a good tenant who's not paying but probably will eventually is very valuable still. When you are, if you kick them out, you're probably not going to get another tenant, 
or it's going to take a while. So you're going to lose more money playing hardball. It's just so I don't, I'm not, I don't think you'll see an eviction tsunami because landlords are not stupid and they want to keep someone in the place. Um, but that security deposit is really important because a lot of people assume, oh, it's my last month's rent. And you really have to make very clear, no, that's not what it's for, because people will leave their uh, units in absolute mess. And, um, you know, my experience as a landlord is we have um, had tenants who did so much damage that we made no money even after a year of them renting. And your little bit of help there is that um, security deposit. So I think were they to use a security deposit for a month's rent, when it's time to go, they're out the door. And you have to clean everything up and you have no help. So, it, and, and we've done things here. You can kick them out if they're, you know, destructive or for a variety of things. And that's critical. Um, so anyway, that's, I, I, that's, a, that's a real risk <laughs> for a landlord. Thank you. Um, Ms. LaFrance, did you want to speak to the amendment? Uh, no, thank you. Not on the amendment. Thank you. Ms. Allard, did you want to speak to the amendment? Can you, um, can we talk about it a little bit more as far as a little bit more of your clarification on it, Felix? I, our chair? I just, because I do have some input, but I want to make sure that this is the one I want to speak about. Sh sure. So the amendment that Mr. Weddleton is proposing is deleting the clause of beginning on page five, uh, excuse me, line five, page two, allowing tenants to use their security deposit to pay off rent arrears. So did you have a, a comment on that amendment? So, no. Okay, oh, okay. I'll, I'll leave you in the queue. Okay, thanks. Uh, Mr. Dunbar on the amendment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I oppose this amendment, and I think it's because of a sort of disconnect in uh, sort of the reality of the facts on the ground. And I experienced this a little bit when I was working at Alaska Legal Services and then just personally as a, as a renter and, and maybe some other people has experienced this too. And that is, so you, you cannot use the security deposit for rent in normal circumstances. Um, so for example, if the, if the um, tenant skipped out on their last month of rent and just vacated the premises, the uh, the, the recourse for the um, landlord is not to take part of the rent, the, the security deposit. They still have to return the security deposit and then they could sue them in small claims court. Um, but the practical, uh, I think the lived experience for most people that are renters is that it, it kind of goes the opposite way. That is, they get to the end of their rent and then some landlords, not all of them, but some of them go through their apartment and sort of pick out a lot of little things. and. There, it is frequently subject to abuse where the tenants do not receive their security deposit back. And often these are folks who are not very sophisticated in knowing that they need to take them to small claims court as well. Um, and so the, some landlords, and again, not all by any means, but some landlords take advantage of the ability that they can hold on to that security deposit at the end. So I think what this does is sort of takes it from both directions. It, it gives the landlord and the tenant the ability to apply the security deposit to rent, which I think they both would want to do in the short term. In the short term. But I think it also might protect some of the tenants as they are being forced to vacate by this tsunami um, from some of the abuses of, uh, of unscrupulous landlords. Which again, not all landlords by any means, um, but uh, just Again, in seeing some of the things I've seen in the last legal services, I, I, I think that uh, it would be wise to leave this in the resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Constant on the amendment. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, that's, a, it is a perspective that the landlord is abusive and you suggest not always, but often and <clears throat> these security deposits are actually there to protect both parties and they're there for a reason and you know in the real estate business you can't even hold a security deposit your brokerage has to hold the security deposit because it's such an important element to keep between the parties and so I, I think I actually support Mr. Weddleton's amendment in this context because <clears throat> those dollars aren't rent those dollars are to protect both of the parties from losses thank you Ms. Kennedy on the amendment 
Yes, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm going to support the amendment, too. You know, I had first spoken about the idea of supporting the resolution as a whole, and I do, but there are, that is actually one part of the resolution that, that I do have a little bit of heartburn with. One of the things that, that I would like to see is this not be so prescriptive. I mean, there's other parts in the, um, uh, in the uh, resolution that talks about court rules and services and, you know, just the ability for landlords as well as tenants and, and building owners to actually have conversations to come up with ideas. So I'm, I'm hesitant to support something that's really prescriptive in this. And I think by taking out that particular part, we make this uh, much more of a usable document rather than a uh, document that says, oh, you should specifically do this one thing. So I'll support uh, uh, eliminating that particular phrase. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Zolotel? Um, thank you. Um, I agree with Mr. Waddleton and Mr. Constant on this because landlords are also supposed to hold the security deposit separate and in trust. Um, and I, whether or not they do, they're supposed to. And you could end up, if a tenant, you still run the same risk because, um, as you point out, Mr. Dunbar, if a tenant has created damages and there's no security deposit left, they could be subject to small claims and landlords are typically more sophisticated than tenants. Um, so I think keeping the security deposit in place protects that it with I mean we need to do some landlord education it sounds you know apartments need to be and rentals need to be broom clean not perfect with actual wear and tear um, so I think that's actually how we get at this issue um, and I will just take this opportunity to plug that if you are a landlord out there there's a wonderful landlord tenant handbook you should read it and you should give it to your tenants. It's the playbook by which rentals should work. So I think we need to keep this, uh, support Mr. Waddleton's amendment, um, but I, I do get Mr. Dunbar's point. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Dunbar? Thank you. Uh, two things. One, clarify, Mr. Constant, I think, put words in my mouth that I, if I said it, I apologize. I don't think I said the majority of landlords or even a large large percentage of them. If I did, I apologize. There are a relatively small group of unscrupulous landlords. But I think we need to think about which of these is the more sophisticated party and which of them is more at risk. So if a, if a, a renter is evicted, um, or even if they just leave voluntarily in the next couple of months, I believe that there is a greater chance in those cases that um, that a, uh, those unscrupulous landlords could hold on to the, that security deposit. And then I am not sure, and perhaps the legal department could correct me, I'm not sure where the Alaska court system is right now in terms of small claims courts. I'm not sure if there is much of a, um, I know that they're very backed up because of COVID-19, and I would be willing to bet that it would take a very long time for renters to successfully use small claims court to reclaim their uh, the security deposit that they are entitled to. Um, and so I think in the short term, it helps both parties in terms of getting through the crisis in rent. And I think it also acknowledges the fact that some landlords, again, small group of landlords, will abuse this system and the fact that they know that the small claims courts are not functioning right now to hold on to that security deposit. Um, so I, I, I am still opposed to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Dunbar. Mr. Rivera? Uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, so I, I am convinced by uh, arguments on both sides of this issue. So um, we will see how I vote. But um, I, uh, you know, for my part, uh, throughout this, in crafting this entire resolution, um, the basic principle that I had hoped uh, was that tenants and landlords would be able to uh, work together and um, be able to uh, accomplish the same goals and in the end do, do no harm. So um, I'm convinced by both of the arguments and uh, we, we will see how I vote when we get there. Thank you, Mr. Rivera. Um, Ms. Allard. Thank you. So um, I'm actually not on board with this at all, this resolution. And I think that I support where our governor already stands on this 
um, and what he's already decided, I think this is just going to be a snowball effect and completely affect um, the landlords in its entirety. And to call renters not sophisticated, um, I think that was, that's not true. I know a lot of people in the military that have rented and saved their money so that they can buy their homes. Uh, but I, I just really disagree with this altogether. And I think that if we wanted to relieve those that are in some sort of rent crisis, then we need to handle it locally, as we've been claiming as a body, and not bring the state into this level of, of our decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Uh, excuse me, Ms. Quinn Davidson on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to speak against the amendment. I completely agree with everything Mr. Dunbar said. And I think there's sort of normal case scenario, and being an attorney who's worked in real estate and land use, I understand the points that the others are making. But I think right now our duty is to protect the most vulnerable among us, and that is renters over landlords. And um, I think that Forrest is right, that if we pass this with that amendment, and of course we're a few steps from this actually becoming any sort of law, but if we recommend that, um, what we're recommending is a system that would have money lost, uh, stuck in limbo for a while, and not in the hands of renters. And this is the time that we need it in their hands the most. So I'm against the amendment. Thank you. Mr. Dunbar on the amendment? Yeah, I just want to briefly say, um, again, <laughs> I feel like people putting words in my mouth tonight. Uh, on average, it is the case that there are a pool of more vulnerable people, as Ms. Austin Quinn Davidson said, Ms. Quinn Davidson said, um, that are less sophisticated in legal matters. And that is, on average, it is absolutely not every renter uh, or even a majority of renters, um, but there is a vulnerable community within the renter population um, that is, on average, less likely to uh, successfully use the tools of the legal system for their own protection. And um, again, I, I am worried about potential abuse of that community um, when it comes to this uh, eviction tsunami. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote on the amendment. Ms. Kennedy. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. No. Mr. Perez Verdia. No. That amendment passes seven to four. Uh, we are now back on the main motion. Ms. LaFrance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, actually, I have a question concerning the Rental Mortgage Relief Fund. And since yesterday we learned that there's about, well, there's over $2 million left in that fund. And I'm curious as to the timing um, for turnaround when people apply for assistance, how long that takes. Because um, I know we already discussed the amendment for item three and everything. But when I had read that, um, it did make me wonder if there was an issue with timing and how quickly people are able to get assistance. Thank you. Someone from the administration want to talk to that? Uh, th through the chair, um, uh, Assembly Member uh, LaFrance, um, there, there is certainly um, some lag in between when an individual calls 211 to request uh, rental assistance. Um, most of that is uh, as a result of all of the verification processes that need to take place um, for additional information. Obviously, they contact their landlord to, to verify that the individual is in some sort of arrears, either uh, going back to, I believe we included all the way back to April uh, with the, uh, the rental relief program. Um, but to date, um, we have helped over 800 uh, unique 
individual or households with this, and I believe the exact dollar amount that we have dispersed to date is a little over $800,000. So we are in the process of um, updating the grant agreement to uh, ensure that there is the additional money that has already been appropriated by the assembly to uh, go towards um, this program. So we fully expect that um, there will be con a continued need, obviously, I think, as everyone has recognized, um, with uh, unemployment insurance and, and other aspects of some federal programs ending by the end of this week that starting sometime next month or um, into maybe September, uh, there will be an increased need. So we will continue to monitor that and we uh, will try to, um, during our assembly updates that we send every single week, try to continue to provide that additional information um, on this particular program. Quick follow-up, Mr. Chair. So does it take like two, four weeks or so from the time of the call to 211 to when the individual receives assistance, or do you have just a ballpark for that time frame? Thank you. Uh, through the chair, uh, I, I don't know the exact um, um, uh, time, but I can certainly uh, find that out and, and get that information. But I do not believe it's anywhere close to four weeks. Uh, it's as quickly as both the individual and the landlord turns around and provides the additional information. So there have certainly been some that have taken longer, not through any fault of our, our own, but it's just the, the verification side of the, the process. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. Ms. Kennedy. Yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. That item passes 10 to 1. We now have before us item 10D8, AM 433-2020, sole source uh, non-encumbering master service agreement with N. Harris Computer Corporation for professional services, training, and ongoing maintenance service for the Municipality of Anchorage Office of Information Technology. What is the will of the body? Moved to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Ms. Kennedy, you pulled this item? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I pulled this item because it's a, um, a contract with the um, uh, organization or the um, software, probably, the program that manages the room tax and alcohol tax and marijuana tax. And one of the things that I know and we've heard um, several times is that there are problems with our tax assessing system software. So, I was wondering if I could get some clarity on exactly what this particular program uh, it works toward or, or, or what it does, and um, uh, if this has anything to do or is related in any way to the new software that we're about to um, uh, purchase or implement uh, in the uh, uh, Treasury Department or Tax Assessor's Office. I'm not exactly sure which one is the better way to, um, you know, better way to say that. But anyway, I just kind of wanted some conversation about really what this is for. I have some real concerns if we are dealing with a very old program. It sounds like this started back in 2000. Um, and I'll have to recheck that information. But anyway. Um, if we've got glitches in our system that keeps us from actually doing adjustments to our taxes, uh, uh, we want, I want to make sure that uh, we're not going down kind of a long path with, um, with this particular um, sole source contract. Thanks. Um, through the chair, uh, Alex Slipka, CFO. Um, so Harris is actually a software provider completely unrelated to our 
a real property tax system. That is the CAMA system, which is in the middle of a multi-year upgrade. Harris is the provider that we utilize for the support of a lot of our extra taxes. And the reason for this request is that we are adding the capability to implement the alcohol tax. So this, along with another item that's being introduced uh, for additional labor, is to help us uh, implement the alcohol tax on time. Um, Harris is a uh, very um, current provider of software, and uh, it is in no way uh, antique. Did you have a follow-up, Ms. Kennedy? Um, I had some difficulty um, hearing Mr. Slivka um, in his explanation, but it sounds like this is just a long-standing relationship uh, with this particular um, program company. Um, uh, so, but it, is it clear then that it's not related to the new system that we're trying to implement um, for the tax assessor program? Uh, yes, through the chair, this is completely unrelated to the CAMA property tax system. This software system um, is really a very modern system, and it, it, we utilize it for uh, the revenue taxes that are listed there, alcohol uh, and marijuana, among others. Okay, thank you then. Um, I guess a bit of a follow-up. Um, if we are implementing um, a new tax system, to, uh, software, um, why are we not incorporating uh, the room tax, alcohol tax, and marijuana tax into the new program, the new software? Um, through the chair. So uh, this is the one system that we use for all of those taxes, and so we are using the same system that we already have in place uh, to uh, bring on board the alcohol tax. So we are doing exactly as you suggested. Okay, uh, thank you. I'm not sure I caught all that, but anyway, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. Ms. Kennedy. Yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Yes. Mr. Peterson. Ms. Queen yes. Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. That item passes 11 to 0. We now have before us item 10E5, AR number 2020-269, a resolution of the Municipality of Anchorage appropriating the proceeds from a Federal Aviation Administration Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act grant in an amount of $17,898,468 to the Merrill Field Operating Grants Fund for the purpose of supporting airport and aeronautical activities. Wayne reading. Thank you. Um, what is the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, Ms. Kennedy, you pulled this item? I did, thank you. Um, I guess I wanted clarification on if this is just an acceptance of the money or if this is actually uh, has to do with how the money is going to be spent. Because um, if we're looking at uh, kind of the breakdown of how the money will be spent, I think we need a bigger conversation on that. So. Um, you know, one of my options would be to move to postpone this. So just need some clarification on what this does. Thanks. Um, through the chair, Assemblymember Kennedy, it does both. Um, what this is appropriating the entire amount of the $17.8 million, but it also would make some adjustments into the 2020 um, uh, budget for Merrill Field. They want to uh, take on some uh, resources to start a, um, a simulator program and uh, they do have a longer term plan to uh, do a couple things. One would be to providing some rent relief to the folks out at Merrill Field over a five year period, but um, that has not been determined. So the key is to appropriate all the money at this time and then as Merrill Field includes it into their operating budgets in the future and their capital budgets into the future, we would have to come to the assembly for that approval. Thank you. 
Any follow up, Ms. Kennedy? Yes, if I could, Mr. Chair. So, um, so this, we would then see how the money would be uh, spent uh, in future ordinances or um, resolutions, I guess would be the appropriate term. So this is, like I said, it's just putting all of the money into their capital, uh, but in terms of how it's actually going to be spent, that will follow later. Am I clear on that? <laughs> um, through the chair, Assemblymember Kennedy, it actually put it actually puts all of their money into their operating into an operating fund, and so as they uh, use, if they tap into these funds in 2021 and into the future, we will show this as the revenue source and to support those. And if they decide to apply um, the dollars to capital projects and programs, it will show up in their capital budget and show that this is the source of the funds to uh, complete those capital projects. And so that's, that's okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Constant? Yeah, thank you. Ms. Kennedy, um, we did have a briefing on this at the Enterprise Utility Oversight Committee. Mr. Gibbs came and attended that meeting. I'm sorry you weren't able to attend. I know you've had some challenges in your family. And so this conversation has been going on since about March or April. They received notification of the funding and Mr. Gibbs has done a really extraordinary job of working with uh, individuals like Bill Starr and the Fairview Community Council and a number of interested parties to come up with the allocations that they have addressed in their plan. There is a PowerPoint we could have sent your way uh, that was sent out that kind of detailed their program. It's going to be a number of things, some beautification along the edges of the airstrip, some building improvements that are going to put old buildings back into function, one that's going to create an incubator for aviation businesses out on the property, and just a number of very interesting projects. And Mr. Starr's request was that they do provide some kind of relief to the tenants on Merrill Field, and so that was incorporated into the package. Mr. Gibbs has done a pretty darn good job of getting this thing lined up. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Constant. That was kind of a missing piece I needed. I was aware of some of the questions about how that funding would be used, but I hadn't seen any information about what the decisions were. So appreciate that um, background. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. Ms. Kennedy. Yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. That item passes 11 to 0. We now have before us an unnumbered AR. An item 10E8, a resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly authorizing funding to build the capacity of the Assembly Office and Assembly Council's office to respond to the COVID-19 emergency for $175,000 from the CARES Act funds pre uh, previously appropriated to the State Direct Federal Pass-Through Grants Fund. What is the will of the body? Moved to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Ms. Quinn Davidson, you pulled this item? I did. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I guess I just wanted um, Ms. Salatel or, or Mr. Constant to speak to this and how we would actually divvy this up. And it's a little confusing to me because from the AM, I understand that it's for legal assistance and for our aid, I think. So you can clear that up if I'm wrong. But then um, in the resolve section, section one says that it's for outreach and education. So I'm just trying to understand what exactly it's for, how does it square with any other funding we have, and then it, it, whatever it's for, can the assembly department use that? And I'd like them or Dean to speak to that if there's um, a legal element to it. Thanks. Um, thanks, Ms. Quinn Davidson. You actually raise, um, we have an error. We need to make an amendment. The line on page two of the AR um, at line two is actually a mistaken holdover from Mr. Rivera's resolution. It should instead read, um, for the purpose of funding, increasing assembly capacity 
uh, through additional eight hours and high, or sorry, increasing assembly capacity. Wait, sorry, I'm doing this on the fly. I apologize. One more time, for purposes of funding and increase and increasing assembly capacity through additional eight hours and hiring additional aid staff to and support the clerk and assembly council's office. I believe that was a motion. That is a motion. Second. Yep. Uh, so we're going to go ahead. Uh, need just a little bit of a break. And Mr. Chair, once the break is over, will you read that back, everyone? Sure. Well, for me. Oh, awesome! Thank you. Okay, uh, can you go ahead and read that into the record, please? Yes, Mr. Chair. The amendment is on page two of the AM to the resolution. It is um, at line four. So at the end of line four, it will read, and support for the clerks and assembly council's offices. So the full sentence reads, 125,000 to the Anchorage assembly for purpose of increasing assembly capacity through additional aid hours and hiring additional aid staff and support for the clerks and assembly council's offices. Okay. Mr. Chair? Uh, yes. Go ahead, Ms. Quinn Davidson. Sorry, I bet, I bet Ms. Bell, sorry, I can't see if folks are in the queue. I bet Ms. Bell is going to weigh in that she was actually also proposing an amendment to the AR, I believe, on the top of page two. Yes, that's what we have before us at this time is uh, the amendment uh, as uh, the clerk read. She said the AM. Um, no, I believe it's the, the AR, so it's page two of the AR is where yes. the... I agree, but I don't think that's what the clerk said, so anyway, okay, thanks. So, she okay. actually caught both my amendments at once. There oh. was an AM error as well, so Barbara, or I'm sorry, the clerk did catch both of them. She got all my notes when she read that back. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Um, so, Ms. Zolotel, did you want to speak to that anymore? I think that more accurately, accurately reflects what the, the resolution is. Again, apologies on the error. We just didn't catch it. Um, kind of goes to the whole capacity issue. 
Thanks. Uh, did you want to speak to the amendment, Mr. Constant? Yeah. Well, it's it's one and the same. But um, once we thank you for catching that, Ms. Quinn Davidson, um, it's a good clarification. And but you asked a further question about how would this really work, and that's left pretty wide open that we could at our meeting on Friday have a discussion about how we would do it. There's been discussion about individual staff for members. There's been a question about hiring new temporary members for the clerk staff that would just be helping us to address questions about the CARES Act. Also, assistance for dean and drafting because the legal counsel's office is backed up right now and all of us are backed up right now because the tempo of the work has been so extraordinary because of the pandemic and the pandemic response cares act and so the purpose of these dollars is to allow us like all the other departments to have a small breathing room of uh, human resources to address the massive backlog of work that needs to be done in order to effectively respond to the public's need that they have clearly demonstrated and we know we have very very much before us Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dunbar on the amendment? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought we were back to the... No, we haven't yeah. voted on the amendment yet. Okay. Um, so, seeing no f further discussion, members may proceed to vote on the amendment. Ms. Kennedy? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Yeah. Ms. Quinn Davidson? Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yeah. The amendment passes 11 to 0. We now have the main motion before us. Uh, Mr. Perez Verdia. Thank you. Um, I wanted to just speak in, in, um, in opposition of this. I, I really do understand that everyone is strapped and that we are all um, trying to respond to more now than what, what is normal. Um, but I, I guess I'm really concerned about, you know, the, the investments that we're making in ourselves. And uh, I've been concerned about the, the remodeling of the city hall in terms of, of having offices. And, and, um, and I just feel like that this is a, a bad move for us right, right now with the amount of need that exists in our community and, and investing money in ourselves at this point um, does not seem like, like a very smart move. So um, I just wanted to sort of explain that and say that I, I do understand that we are all very busy and that we, that the clerk's office and all of us and the administration is dealing with um, uh, an increased amount of volume and we want to be able to respond to the community. We want to be able to make sure that we're following through with everything that we're supposed to be doing. Um, but, I, but I don't think that this is the right time to invest uh, this amount of money in, in ourselves. And I think that we need to be focusing this money externally and making sure that it goes to the people in the community who need it most. So uh, that's my thought, and so I'm, I'm a no vote on this. Thanks very much. Thank you. Mr. Weddleton? Thanks. I got a um, question and a, and a comment, I guess. Is, is this, didn't we just pass $50,000, and this is in addition to that? Um, so this is distinct from that. That was specifically for a communications contract with Northwest Strategies mm -hmm. to communicate out what we're going to do with the CARES Act funding. This is more towards our own capacity to bring forward fulsome CARES Act proposals to um, do um, so that Dean can have more capacity with regards to both CARES Act and emergency um, related um, items that we bring forward and questions we have around that um, and frankly um, it's so that we can once we communicate out to the public through Northwest Strategies so that we can respond to the public um, and keep up with them and have a meaningful dialogue about how we're going to respond to the COVID-19 um, emergency not just as we appropriate CARES Act funds but all of it. Um, I think we don't have the same infrastructure as the administration, and that puts us at somewhat of a disadvantage um, to, to really dig in and do this work, plus then the work we try to do just to keep up with the day-to-day. -day. Anything else, Mr. Weddleton? Oh, I guess I'm mulling it over. I, I'm very comfortable with 50000 to help Dean do his work because man works like crazy but we just dump so much on him 
it's um, not fair and, and it gets unproductive. Um, but the rest, I'm not quite as convinced, but I don't generally use aid money. Um, okay, you can take me out, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Zolotel? Um, thanks. Um, so a little bit more. Um, I did reach out to the clerk's office for some great suggestions. Um, one was that we could maybe have um, aids that were body wide that could help with some of the document preparation and formatting. Um, I think we're running and that's a big issue um, as we're trying to um, put documents forward and get them in in time for the addendum in particular. Um, and I can um, say that I have utilized my aid at full capacity and we're still playing catch up as we, I mean, we're trying to put together eight Folsom Cares Act proposals for this Friday. Um, and when we're in meetings, it is time I don't have to talk to community partners and collaborators and run down research. And we've got to do more of that ourselves, I think, because the administration is stretched thin as well. Um, you know, we can give them all the great ideas, but they only have limited capacity to run down things as well. So I, I think this is us kind of picking up part of our portion to, to dive in deep on some of this stuff. Some of the things we're proposing, like childcare and um, possibly um, other types of relief, we've really got to know, like, what's the impact? Who are we targeting? How's it going to be implemented so that we can really vet those programs? And I think we need to do that work and, and not just rely on the administration um, and what the, they may be suggesting. Thank you. Ms. Allard? Thank you. So with the $175,000, I just did super quick math. And on the average, we have $1,275 that we've been allocating for um, individuals that need to pay their rent. That would help 137 families. And if we were to bump it up to $2,000 um, on an average, then the 175,000 would help 87 families approximately. So I think that we should strike this completely, but I do sort of agree with John that maybe we can allocate certain funds to Dean to help him out on the legal aspect of things. But other than that, I totally disagree with this. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Constant? Yeah, I think it's actually a due diligence issue. Divide $156 million into $175,000, and that's the administrative chunk that we're asking to have help to get through this process. And I actually think that's a nominal amount, even though it is 87 families or some other number, but we will be getting to millions more for rent assistance and we'll get there in a very thoughtful way as opposed to in a slapdash way in a rush to the finish because there's a deadline coming on Friday and if you don't have it in, you don't have it by the 11th and if it's not done by the 11th, then the package isn't complete and then we're failing the public. That's the pressure we're under and so I think it's a reasonable ask. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. LaFrance? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Constant um, made that last point very nicely. And I just wanted to add that this is not so much um, funding in ourselves or for ourselves, but in the staff that enables us to serve the public. And as it's been pointed out, we are running into roadblocks. And I know just even researching for specific programs um, for CARES Act funding, I'm way behind the curve on that. And those are the things that serve the community and serve our constituents. And as Ms. Elitel pointed out, formatting items and just trying to do some of the general day-to-day -day stuff, I think it's very clear that if we are going to effectively serve the public, especially during this time, um, we need more assistance. Dean needs more assistance and a general aid. I think it's a great idea who could pick up a lot of the stuff. Um, and I don't think it's been lost on anybody too how many overtime hours the clerk's office must be generating just to keep up with all these special meetings. So I'm in support. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Dunbar? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I, uh, I apologize. I seem to have mis misplaced the resolution um, in my scatter of papers here. Um, I guess my question is partly for the clerk's office. So I'll say two things. One, um, I, I support if we do go forward with this, 
the resources being concentrated in the clerk's office and in shared staff the way that Desiree, uh, for example, Ms. Camacho is a, a shared finance staff versus individual assembly aides, um, where I think that you're a little bit more hit or miss on, on how effective the, that aid program is. And some folks like Mr. Welton don't even use the, all the aid money. Um, but that centralized staff, I think we have a good track record with people like Mr. Gates, of course. Um, so I guess my, my uh, one more comment and then a question. Uh, for, to Mr. Perez Rodia's point, um, I would remind people that we've already appropriated more than $20 million of CARES Act money, a lot of which went to things like rental relief and child care, and that's still being rolled out, but it's, it's, <laughs> we've already put out a tremendous amount of money, um, and those proposals largely came from the administration because we don't have the capacity to generate them ourselves, and then we're about to, hopefully, on the 11th, push out another $90 million dollars or whatever it ends up being, um, for the clerk's office. And again, I apologize, I don't have the resolution. If we were to pass this and have the $175,000, what's the time frame in which we need to spend it? So for example, could these staffers be there for six months? Because I would remind people, this probably isn't the only CARES Act that's coming down the pike. Um, we're going to have real capacity issues in September and October when this next round, what's now being called the HEROES Act, and it's going to be amended, but there's a good chance that there's some monies in there we'll have to deal with in one way or another. And so does this capacity last us through the end of the year, or what's the time frame envisioned uh, by the clerk's office if we were to hire CARES Act-related staffers? Terrible. Could I ask the clerk that, Ms. Jones? Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Dunbar. I don't know the answer to that. You would need to talk to the sponsor. Okay. I'll do whatever you want. <laughs> okay. So for the sponsors, then, what's the vision for the time frame which is spent? I have, Mr. Chair, long advocated for the fact that in October we should be spending the remainder of the funds. We need that contingency because Lord knows what's coming. And if we spend everything we have now, then we will find ourselves needing and not being prepared. And so there's no argument that says this happens and then is gone in August. The, the argument is a medium-term investment through, through September, October, even through the end of the year or beyond just to the end of this cycle. Um, a number of members have brought up concerns about potential holes in the budget that may come up because of short revenue, because of COVID. And so we don't even know the dynamics that are coming. And so I think that the, the more of a bolstered system that we have, we, we, you, you'd be irrational not to recognize the fact that we're firing beyond all cylinders right now, that we need to expand our capacity. And I think on Friday, we can talk specifically about how to achieve that, but it's a wise thing to do to be prepared, come what may. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll just say I, I do intend to support this. Uh, the simple adage, you know, measure twice, cut once. Um, we need to know what we're doing over the course of the next three months because there's going to be a tremendous amount of money we're going to be allocating. And I, I think right now we all feel the pressure of trying to do that well. And I do think we need more support, particularly more legal support in order to do that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'm just kind of mulling this over, too, because um, I do think we can use the extra help uh, in the attorney's office. And I'm actually a little bit more concerned about not having given enough to the Assembly Council office versus giving it to us for additional aid hours or for hiring an additional aid. Um, but uh, so I, I guess somebody can clarify for me. Uh, how fluid or flexible this funding might be because um, it, it sounds to me like um, the 125000 would actually just be allocated for assembly members to use for additional staff that it really isn't uh, it really isn't going toward anything that would actually uh, work in the for anybody that would be working in the um, uh, clerk's office um, so um, Anyway, I, you know, I guess I'm still kind of trying to figure out what the best use of this fund, what the uh, best use of these funds is, especially considering the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm overwhelmed as well, and my aid is a bit overwhelmed. So I'm trying to think, okay, do I just want to add the hours to my aid that are already available to me, um, because we did increase that uh, in this year's budget, um, 
or would I even consider hiring, uh, you know, additional staff, uh, you know, just an additional aid? And I think timing in that is, is, is a problem, too. Um, you know, would we be able to use this fund in a timely manner, uh, especially since we're going to be making these decisions on Friday to put forward the package for the CARES funding on the 11th? So I'm not sure that gives us the, the time to actually hire any additional aides or staff. So anyway, um, I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that, but um, this is a little, um, not, well, convoluted and a bit frustrating, but thanks. Thank you. Ms. Zolotel? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'll address some of Ms. Kennedy's concerns. And I just wanted, I got in the queue to remind us all that we have approved funding for the administration to hire on additional staff during this emergency. Um, and it comes at a much steeper price tag. Um, so um, I hear you, Ms. Kennedy. Um, I have consulted with Assembly Council's office, um, and that number was through their office. Um, I think there's enough, enough flexibility in the wording, especially with the amendment and correcting that language, that it goes in um, to the clerk's office as well, so that we look at a joint aid. Um, I do, I do think that if members, and I think we need to discuss it, want to hire a second aid if your aid is maxed out, you know, as we move from. Um, this current CARES Act discussion um, and beyond um, to put together additional CARES Act proposals, I, I think that would be appropriate, especially if we're going to continue to engage with the public and get their feedback on what, what did we miss, what more do we need, what are the issues out there that we just haven't been able to get our finger on because we don't know about it. I, I fear that some of the issues related to COVID are going to be ones that don't get onto our radar because those folks are just working to survive and we might not be doing the most responsive thing. So I think there's a lot of flexibility here for us to be responsive. Um, and I, I hope that addresses your concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Can I, can I comment on that, Mr. Chair? Sure, go ahead. Um, thank you. Um, Thank you, Ms. Volatil. I mean, I appreciate some of the clarification on that, but I still think it gets a little problematic in terms of trying to figure out exactly how we would allocate those funds. I mean, if I decide I want to hire a whole new staff person and I want to max out my current staff person, you know, I could, uh, I guess on my own, eat up a pretty good chunk uh, of the funding. So it, it comes to a place where now we're trying to figure out, okay, who's actually going to be using this funding since we're sort of in this shared capacity kind of idea. Um, so again, it gets a little um, convoluted. Um, so I'm still not sure how I'm going to vote on this, but um, I appreciate um, the clarification you did give. Thanks. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. Uh, Mr. Rivera, I think oh. I was in the queue. Sure. Go ahead, Ms. Quinn Davidson. I guess I just wanted to say that I appreciated all this discussion, and I think this is sort of what I was looking for in addition to making those corrections in the AR and AM. And I think that Ms. Salatel and Mr. Constant are right, and, you know, we're really, what we've seen in the last few weeks is we're really on the front lines, um, and we're the main communicators with folks out in the public. And so when people reach out to us and they want you know, to be connected with the rental assistance program, or they want us to pass an ordinance that would benefit the community and we can't get Dean's time. Those are essential pieces to us being successful, and by successful I mean representing our constituents. So I think this makes a lot of sense. I appreciate all the discussion and explanation, and I'll be voting yes. Thank you. With that, members may proceed to vote. Ms. Kennedy. Yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. No. That item passes nine to two. We now have before us item 10 F four AIM number 102-2020 second quarter 2020 performance measure report. Uh, what is the will of the body? I move to accept. Second. Moved and seconded. Ms. Kennedy, you pulled this one? 
Yes, I did. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, I pulled this one uh, kind of for the same reason I pulled it last quarter. Um, there is a great deal of information in this particular report, and we seem to do nothing with it. So um, there were several things in here that I think were probably noteworthy, um, and, and a lot of things that should be kind of questioned and, and had further discussion about. Um, you know, this is kind of the, the whole uh, report about where different departments believe they've met their goals or, um, you know, the measurements they've had to typically um, – uh, do a little bit of quality insurance with assurance with, and I was just wondering if um, I think the last time we did this, or that I pulled this, I asked the mayor's office if uh, he if there was anything there that was noteworthy, anything that they thought uh, they were going to really look into themselves and address, and I was just hoping to suggest that maybe that be the kind of comment that we get from a regular basis off of these. Um, I think I certainly think there's some interesting information in this in terms of the crime report data. Uh, I certainly think there were some questions about um, uh, some purchasing uh, percentage of contracts with increased funding and added addendum and you know just anyway just a lot of really interesting things and I'm hoping uh, that we can actually either decide that these reports are worthy enough for us to consider and maybe have a conversation about, or at least get the highlights on, or, or they're not. So um, anyway, uh, we just kind of maybe like a, a comment maybe from the mayor's office about whether or not we maybe could get a little bit more of a narrative on this report when it comes in. Thanks. Thanks. Go ahead. Um, through the chair, Assemblymember Kennedy, thank you for the comments. And um, yes, we could absolutely do that. Um, similar to the quarterly reports we provide on the budget to actuals, we give you a little summary of some of the highlights. Um, we give you this report um, uh, on a quarterly basis as required by code, but we can certainly add some information to the AIM that kind of highlights the things that we see uh, in the um, performance measures. The second quarter performance measures are really also the ones that we use to start as the foundation for the 21 operating budget. So when we do see some things in there, we do ask departments um, what kind of changes they're seeing, what kind of resources uh, are being ch uh, changing, and if they had more, how would it affect their performance, and if they had less, how is it going to affect their performance? So thank you for the comment, and we can certainly brush it up on the next quarter report. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and just, just an additional comment. It's, like I said, there is a lot of information here. I don't know how much time or effort Assembly members put into going through it because it's, very, it's just a lot of information and a lot of graphs, a lot of charts. Um, so anyway, anything that I think would um, be helpful to us to make this report more useful to us, since we do get it, would probably be uh, to our advantage in the long run. So thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. Ms. Kennedy. Yes. Mr. Peterson. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yeah. That item, uh, that motion passes 11 to 0. Uh, before we go on to the next item on our agenda, I believe uh, Mr. Bakken said has some information regarding uh, the rental relief. It was a question asked earlier. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was able to uh, track down some additional information on the kind of the timeline um, from the folks at 211. And just to provide that update, um, typically every single day, 211 provides the list of everyone that has called to the provider that ultimately will sit down with them um, to determine their eligibility. Appointments have typically been set up within two weeks, and there are multiple steps within that two weeks where there are reminders set to the, sent to those individuals uh, telling them what documents and what other things that they need to provide and bring to the, uh, the meeting that they have. And then as long as um, 
all of those documents are brought and they are verified at the meeting, typically they leave with a check made out to their landlord that day. Um, there are certainly, as I mentioned, um, some others that, uh, for whatever reason, do not bring all of the necessary documents to the meeting, so that certainly extends the timeline a little bit. But um, I think I was mostly right in that um, the vast majority of them are fulfilled within two weeks. And the only clarification that I would make, as I did say, that uh, we call uh, the, the different landlords, that was the only part that was incorrect on, on what I said. Uh, we, as part of the documentation, ask them to bring their lease, and then uh, the individuals or the providers uh, verify um, through um, property records and things like that 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 is the actual owner of, of that building, um, but we do not call the actual landlords. So thank you. Thank you. Next, we have item 10F5. Uh, AIM number 103-2020, transmittal of the Planning and Zoning Commission record and recommendation of denial of an ordinance amending the Anchorage 2040 land use plan, land use plan map to change the classification of approximately 5.61 acres of land from compact mixed residential low to commercial corridor for tract A1 Adamsville subdivision, generally located northeast of the intersection of DeBar Road and Beaver Place. What is the will of the body? Move to accept. Is there a second? Second. Wants to kill it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm I'm going to ask Mr. Kshuti, if I could, Mr. Chair, sure. to speak to this. Go ahead. So I have a couple questions, Mr. Shuti, and I'll preface this by saying I'm familiar with this property, as is Mr. Uh, Peterson. We, we've heard this person present at the community council, um, and the underlying substance I, I think I'm comfortable with, which is, you know, we just had two weeks of very passionate te testimony telling us to use planning and zoning and respect planning and zoning. Well, planning and zoning has said deny this. So, but my questions are, and, and I, I apologize because as we've talked about here, we've been sort of overwhelmed. This is the kind of thing I would usually have sent emails about offline. But why are there two of these? And what's the effect of accepting one or both of them? And also, it re references an ordinance multiple times, but I don't see any ordinance introduced. So could you speak to this, please? Oh, your mic's not on. They covered up the button. Uh, through the chair, Chris Shuddy, Director of Economic and Community Development. So uh, fascinating questions. I can't wait to answer them. Uh, you have two items in front of you. They are concurrent because they are related actions that are required to be taken at the Planning and Zoning Commission to effectuate a rezone of this type. Um, the first action is an amendment to the comprehensive plan. Um, and that is required where there is a discrepancy between what the comprehensive plan lays out for the community and what a given property owner would like to do um, with that property through the process of a rezone. So uh, in this case, because the area is identified in the comprehensive plan as a residential area, a rezone away from residentially zoned property to commercial property would require a corresponding amendment to the comprehensive plan. Uh, so typically those travel uh, together to planning and zoning for approval uh, or denial by planning and zoning. Um, in the agenda in front of you, this item 10F5 is actually uh, in error. And so our request to pull it was because we provided it to the assembly via an AIM and the appropriate way for this information to be provided to the assembly is through an AO, and that was our oversight. Um, we didn't catch it until it was too late, so we, we have asked that this one <clears throat> be pulled because it needs to come back to you in the form of an AO. The, the content of it will not change. It is still a denial from the Planning and Zoning Commission to modify the comprehensive plan to accommodate uh, a change from the residential use identified to a commercial use. It's just the vehicle by which we transport it to you uh, was incorrect, so I apologize for that. Thank you, Mr. Shuddy. May I ask a quick follow-up, Mr. Chair? Um, does what you just said for F5 also apply to F6? That is, should we not move F6 and let it die as well? Um, through the chair, Assemblymember member Dunbar, so 10 F6 is the correct vehicle. Okay. And in the case of a rezone, um, when an applicant is denied by the Planning and Zoning Commission, they have the ability to uh, take the request directly to the assembly if filed within 15 days of the 
um, denial by planning and zoning, which this applicant did. And so the uh, 10F6 is an information memorandum that informs the assembly uh, of that, that the applicant is uh, requesting that the assembly take up and set a public hearing date for uh, a rezone that was denied at planning and zoning. And it references an assembly ordinance, a draft assembly ordinance um, that we included in your packet. It should be one of the attachments and I don't know the number off the top of my head. Um, but if the assembly wished to take up the matter, they would need to, uh, it would take three assembly members, I believe, and I'm looking to Mr. Gates to help verify that. Yep, okay. And uh, it would take three assembly members to, uh, uh, to introduce that ordinance and to set a public hearing date, uh, at which point the assembly would hear public testimony, et cetera, and could render its decision uh, either to approve, to deny, or to remand it back to the Planning and Zoning Commission. It's very interesting. So and I'm looking at F6 now. Within F6, the AIM, there is a, an AO tucked in there. Never seen anything. I, I don't recall seeing something like that before, but perhaps it's come and I just didn't notice it. Um, I, I'll let my colleagues ask their, ask their questions, but I'll just say I intend to move to postpone this indefinitely so we can move on to F6 unless people... Thanks. Mr. Okay. Constant? Yeah, I don't know that we need to move to postpone indefinitely, do we? Can we just move on and let it die? Well, uh, we have... I guess, do I need to withdraw my motion to accept? Uh, so the clerk advises me that uh, we could take one of two options. We could either not vote on this and then it would die by nature of us not taking action, or we could move to postpone indefinitely. So then that brings before us, if I might, Mr. Chair, 10F6. Let's move on. I'd Mr. Whittleton? I'd move to postpone indefinitely. It seems like it'd be more clear on the record. Second. Second. Okay, so now we have a motion to postpone indefinitely. Seeing no discussion, members, uh, is there any opposition? Uh, maybe I could I speak? Oh. I'm sorry. Sure, um, go ahead. And that's because this is wrong. It would have to be an AO. But in, in regards to um, Mr. Dunbar's comment, if were the land use plan not changed, were, are we barred from then considering the next item, which is a rezone, to something the land use plan says you can't do. So you yeah, really need through, to do them both. Through, through the chair, um, Assembly Member Weddleton. So the uh, ordinance that will come back to you for this particular item will be an ordinance that says the Planning and Zoning Commission has denied this amendment to the land use plan map. Without a, a, a corresponding adjustment to the land use plan map, the, the act to uh, actually rezone the property can't happen. Okay, so yeah. are we gonna to go to 10 F6 after this and then? Okay, thanks. Thanks, uh, with that members may proceed to vote. Ms. Ms. Kennedy. Yeah. Mr. Peterson. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Perez Verdia? Yes. Yeah. That uh, motion passes 11 to 0. We now have before us item 10F6, AIM, AIM 104 2020, transmittal of the Planning and Zoning Commission record and recommendation of denial with prejudice of an ordinance amending the zoning map and providing for the rezoning from R to M to B3 for tract A1 Adamsville subdivision generally located northeast of the intersection of DeBar Road and Beaver Place. What is the will of the body? Move to postpone or Wait, set a public the, hearing August 25th. Can, can, can I ask a question before we, before we make any motions? Sure. Is that possible? Mr. Mr. Schutte, what, assuming I want to agree with the Planning and Zoning Commission, what is the appropriate motion at this time? Uh, through the chair, um, Assembly Member Dunbar. So the information memorandum is to provide you the information, which is the, assemb the uh, sorry, the Planning and Zoning Commission has denied this rezone request. The attachment of a draft assembly ordinance gives the assembly the ability, should it choose, to um, go perhaps go differently than the Planning and Zoning Commission to introduce that ordinance and set public hearing date. This is a very unusual circumstance, so I would encourage uh, either 
the municipal clerk or Mr. Gates to help us through this as well. Do you want to have any ad advice for us, Madam Clerk? I'm, I believe Mr. Dunbar's question is, what do I do if I want to agree with the Planning and Zoning Commission? Yes. You move to accept the AIM. Okay. I move to accept the AIM. Second. Moved and seconded. Um, Mr. Dunbar. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. Take, I, I, I got to ask my question. Sure. Mr. Weddleton. Um, <clears throat> thanks. So on this property, it's... Um, large piece of property it's got a roller rink on it and so it's used for commercial uses what um, how far could are they limited just the roller rink could they switch it to a hockey rink could they what, what things could they do within there's some they're grandfathered somewhat right what, what limitations are on them um, <clears throat> through the chair assembly member Weddleton so bro broadly speaking the area the surrounding area supports commercial as you can as you've described but it supports a low intensity commercial and that was not what was requested by this applicant and so the the uh, ability for this rezone to fit within the um, uh, both the comprehensive plan and the surrounding area um, could have been achieved if it was a lesser intense uh, commercial use however because of the applicant's request to convert it to a b3 use that's a typically a higher intensity commercial property or has the potential to be a higher intensity commercial property and is um, uh, is is not compatible with uh, its location in this particular neighborhood could i continue a little bit sure and just a quick note that um, ken fuller is available for questions if we have any for him Go ahead, Mr. Wilson. Yeah, I think people on this body are sick of me saying a rezone is just a rezone. It's not whatever is proposed there. So it was really just a rezone to B3. I mean, we see pictures of a, um, a storage yard, which he may or may not intend to do. But once you do the rezone, he could sell it. It could turn into anything commercial. So, I mean, that's something to bear in mind. You know, I, I'm, you know, I had a long question. I got a really good answer from staff on this one, which you may have seen. but. You know, I think if we have um, high-density neighborhoods, people have a lot of toys, and someone called it excessive toys, so I'm guilty. But, um, you know, it, so having the storage yard nearby lets you have higher density, too. So these things go hand-in-hand hand with our notion of higher density. Is this a good location? I don't know that neighborhood really well. Maybe it's not truly high-density, but it's, if it were, it's kind of handy. It's right there in the neighborhood where you'd want your toys. Um, but, but, it, but again, but a rezone is just a rezone. And if we go B3, it could be anything allowed in B3. So you have to be very cautious there. So I, I, would, I would vote yes on this. So thanks. Thank you. Mr. Constant? Thank you. I concur with both parties. This is not properly a good use for more dense commercial uh, zoning. And the planning zoning, I think, did their job right. This is right off Turpin. You know, this is definitely not a high density residential neighborhood, but it's certainly a residential neighborhood. And I would also just note that it's kind of refreshing just to be dealing with the milk toast zoning question. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gates? Um, thank you. Uh, I wanted to make two points. One was this is probably unusual, as Mr. Dunbar identified, because you're probably used to seeing things from planning and zoning come to you, and they're more in the form of uh, application for an entitlement. And these are different because the comprehensive plan and rezonings are legislative functions. Um, the Alaska Supreme Court has said that we're sort of in a minority of states for rezonings these legislative functions so that's probably why this process seems unusual they're sending a legislative decision to you the legislative policy makers for the municipality so you can do something different it's not the same as when it's an application for um, condition use permit or something like that it wouldn't come to you this way so maybe that's why it seems unusual and these are sort of rare as well and then um, the other point I want to make is uh, Mr. Weddleton has great points, but they sort of go to the merits of the application to rezone. But right now, you just, I think, have an AIM reporting what happened, and uh, the question is accepted, or not, and we're deciding what to do. But we also have some clarification from Mr. Schuette as to the process forward. If you want to debate the merits, you know, bring that ordinance attached to the AIM and introduce it and set it for public hearing, and then you get to that point 
we'll get to dig into all of those things. I mean, if you do get to that point. Um, did I answer anybody's question? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Gates. <laughs> Mr. Weddleton. I just want to clarify. So should on 10F6 the yeses prevail, then 10F5 doesn't have to come back. Is that right? Through the, uh, through the Chair Assembly Member Weddleton. Actually, it does because the way in which it was transmitted to you was incorrect. And when it does come back, um, it will not be in the same form of up or, uh, up, up or down. It will essentially be an assembly ordinance that uh, states that the Planning and Zoning Commission has denied this plan map amendment. So it, it does need to come back to you. It doesn't change the effect of the comprehensive plan amendment or the other item. I gotcha. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. And so getting off of, uh, going to what uh, Mr. Weddleton just said, um, assuming F5 comes back in a different kind of ordinance, would that be an appropriate time to discuss the underlying merits? And if so, and let's say that we do, just, we change our mind and say, no, this actually is an appropriate rezone despite what planning and zoning says. Will there be another opportunity where we could, uh, you know, change that ordinance and perhaps have another ordinance as well? Or is it just that one ordinance that will be getting to the merits? Uh, through the chair, uh, Assembly Member Dunbar, yes, that's a, a good question and actually a little bit of a complicated one to answer because the item on 10F5 is a comprehensive plan amendment. It is not the specific uh, entitlement action related to the property like the rezone is. Um, so if the comp plan amendment, when the comp plan amendment comes back, if there's uh, uh, interest in discussing the merits of the proposed comprehensive plan amendment, that certainly can happen and action can be taken uh, in whatever fashion the assembly chooses. But the rezone itself, the property rezoning, um, would not necessarily be part of that discussion because they are two separate items. One is in a, an amendment to the comprehensive plan of, of Anchorage to allow this type of rezoning to go forward. And then the second item would actually be the rezoning if it were to um, go forward. Can I ask a follow up to that, Mr. Chair? So now I'm starting to think that maybe Mr. Welton was right in the beginning to, to, to extract the ordinance and try to put it on a, the same path as F5. Ms. 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 Zalatel is shaking her head at me, so that's fine. <laughs> but my point is just, if we did decide on the merits that we wanted to approve F5 or, or, or approve that ability to, to have that change in the uh, comprehensive plan, could any assembly member then take this ordinance, even after we've accepted this, and introduce it? Uh, through the chair, assembly member Dunbar, this is where it gets weird. Um, I, I think through consultation today with the planning department and Mr. Gates, what what is happening now is that the applicant has a one-year period from the date that they first file their application for the rezone to um, to have that acted upon, and it's only through a f uh, final action by the assembly or that one-year period expiring that the application to rezone the property um, is no longer a valid application. Uh, and so, it, to your question, if the assembly uh, took up the, the merits of the comprehensive plan amendment through the ordinance that we will bring, bring you and um, perhaps change the, the outcome, then the application to rezone the individual property is technically still alive was my understanding as of today, but I would ask for a second opinion from Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Oh, thank you. I, I agree with Mr. Shuri's summation there. And you need to pass, if you don't pass the uh, comprehensive plan amendment, then passing the rezone would basically be illegal to do so. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Constant? Since we've dived into the nuts and bolts, um, the phrase uh, with denial with prejudice, um, if that's removed, then does that provide some additional benefit to the petition? I'm sorry, it's a little hard to hear you. Can you say it one more time? If, if by amendment we were to remove the denial of prejudice, the denial with prejudice, does that provide any benefit to this applicant? Because it seems like people mm -hmm. are reconsidering. So um, through the chair, Assemblymember Constant, I don't 
I will look to Mr. Gates to back me up, but I don't believe that you have the ability to remove the planning and zoning um, uh, denial with prejudice because that was their action that they took. And uh, what that refers to, for those that are following along, is that an, uh, a rezone application that's denied with prejudice cannot come back in the same form again for two years. Um, and so it's a little bit uh, steeper um, uh, hurdle for a p potential applicant who wanted to come back and try a rezone again. Um, so that's that I don't believe the assembly can modify. Uh, uh, yes, I agree. Thank you. Ms. Zalatel? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm thinking the path forward here would be to postpone this item till the next meeting and then we get the AO. And so we can have them both before us because I think that's where we kind of have a bit of a disconnect now. Not having the appropriate form for F5 has kind of put us in a bit of a, a pause um, and kind of making it a little bit harder to decide what to do here. So um, I guess I would let, if the clerk would like to weigh in on that, I would definitely appreciate that. But um, it feels like that's probably would then align the two items again, which was the original intent tonight. I don't know if that was a question through the chair, assembly member Zalatel, but um, you certainly could do that. Keep in mind, both of these items are recommend, recommended denials from planning and zoning, um, and they are, in, they are connected, as you described, and one is in front of you in the wrong format. Um, while that feels disjointed to do one without the other, um, it, it ultimately may not matter, but that's... Thank you, and um, the clerk does advise me that the other item, when it comes back to us, will have a public hearing, so it won't be set for that public hearing until the 25th of August. Um, Mr. Dunbar? That was gonna be my question. So I guess I would move to postpone this item until, I'm sorry, it was the 25th of August? Yes. Yeah, to the 25th of August. Second. Moved and second for the order. So is that the date for introduction, or does that mean when the public hearing is? That's the public hearing public for hearing. the other ordinance. So when you, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, any discussion on the motion to postpone? Okay. Seeing none, members may proceed to vote on the motion to postpone. Ms. Kennedy. Yeah. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yeah. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yeah. That motion passes 11 to 0. We now have before us item 10 F8, AAM 107 2020. Emergency procurements awarded under AMC 7.20.090. What is the will of the body? Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, Ms. Kennedy, you pulled this one? I did, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I pulled it uh, first, you know, I kind of have a comment that just, um, I do appreciate uh, in this emergency procurement report, the times when a particular uh, hourly rate uh, for some of the procurements is actually listed, uh, just makes it a whole lot easier to, to really uh, get a sense of uh, what the expense is um, but I have a specific question in regard to um, the uh, UAA um, proposal to do uh, the uh, gene genome sequencing uh, research project. Um, it's a $66,000 procurement. It looks like it was initiated by the University of Alaska. So I would kind of want some clarification on kind of like whose idea this was. Um, but I would appreciate a little bit more information about really what it's all about. Um, and I will say I kind of have, I have some questions about data and how data will be used, whether or not data is actually uh, connected with identifiable uh, people in, in this uh, particular project or whether it's all just pretty much random. Uh, so kind of like some clarification on uh, how the data is collected. Uh, and then my final question on it is, is this, um, is this research that the municipality will own, or will this be research that the University of Alaska owns? Um, thank you. 
the chair to Assembly Member Kennedy. So I believe the UAA genotyping project was, was initially proposed by the University of Alaska Anchorage. It was an idea that they said that they had offered to the state. I think the state is already doing some amount of this genotyping work. And they suggested it could be useful to us in our contact tracing <coughs> efforts. The genotyping is not of the humans, it is of the variants of the virus. So there are now already several different versions of the coronavirus that are causing COVID-19 with minor mutations, minor changes. Um, the notion is that if you are detecting all one variant, you can get a better sense of whether you just have widespread community spread that is, um, uh, we're just passing it around internally, or if you're finding new variants, then you know that the, the leak in the system is that new cases are being introduced from some exogenous place. So you'll know, oh, maybe it's coming into the airport or coming into the seafood community. But either way, it would help you make some better decisions about how to respond to different kind of outbreaks. As to who owns the information, I will confess I don't know the answer to that, and I could take that away. I'm not sure we're planning on monetizing it, so I don't know that it has particularly mattered to us. The, the real thing that was the rub where the rubber has hit, going to hit the road is that we want the information to be actionable and useful, and certainly we do think it will be actionable and useful to us. Um, if there are other questions, I can do my best to try to answer them, otherwise I might have to take them offline and uh, confer with other folks. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Falsey. And if I could, Mr. Chair, just uh, another clarification then on the... Go ahead. One of the... So, and that is, I just wanted uh, to, to hear you answer the question about whether or not the testing is identifiable or, or traced to any particular uh, person's individual data. Is it just the tests themselves that are looked at, or are they connecting it to uh, individuals? Thanks. To Assembly Member Kennedy, to the chair, I, I should take that question offline and ask exactly before I just speculate. My suspicion is that the data is anonymized so that we aren't talking about Bill Falsey or Crystal Kennedy, but that it is not completely removed from the person's identity because, again, we want to be able to say, ah, all persons who tested positive in this facility all had the same variant, meaning that we need to be able to associate that genotyping with a particular case. Um, but I can certainly provide, get the, the correct answer and provide it for you. I just don't have it here. Thank you. Yeah, if you don't mind, that would be interesting, an interesting component to that uh, research, too. So thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. Ms. Kennedy. And that completes our consent yeah. agenda. Mr. Peterson. <laughs> Mr. Peterson. Sorry. Yes. There he is. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Berdia. Yes. And that motion passes 11 to 0. And with that, that completes our quote unquote consent agenda. <laughs> Next item we have before us is item 11A, um, Assembly Memorandum Number AM 410 2020, recommendation of award to Stantec Consulting Services, Inc for professional engineering services to assist in the creation of a stormwater utility. Wave reading. Thank you. Um, Madam Clerk, what is the motion on the floor? There is no motion pending. Okay. Um, Ms. LaFrance. <laughs> Move to postpone to the meeting of September 15th. Second. Ms. LaFrance, do you want to speak to that? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. So we had postponed this item um, with the support of the administration from the meeting of July 14th. And earlier in this meeting, we passed a resolution, um, item 10B6, requiring two actions before award of the contract per RFP 2019 P022. And those two actions listed on the resolution prior to award of the contract per RFP 2019 P022, the administration shall appoint and the assembly confirm no fewer than 10 members to serve on the Stormwater Utility Commission 
And the second um, action is prior to award of the contract per RFP 2019 P022, the administration shall engage the Stormwater Utility Commission to review the administration's recommendation of the award and provide recommendations to the assembly within 30 days of the commission's first meeting with a quorum. And it's my understanding in talking with the administration that taking this additional time won't jeopardize the project. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote on the motion to postpone to the meeting of September 15th. Ms. Kennedy. Yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson? Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia? Yes. Mr. Weddleton? That motion passes 11 to 0. We now have before us item 11B, resolution number ER 2020-241, a resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly authorizing the funding of public health and mental health resources in the Anchorage School District allocated from the Federal CARES Act funds. We're reading. Thank you. Well, I guess it's better. Um, Madam Clerk, do we have a motion? No motion pending. Ms. Zolotel? Um, I move to postpone to the meeting of August 11. Second. Moved and seconded. Ms. Zolotel? Um, thank you. This will put this um, item in lines with the rest of the CARES Act items that we plan to bring on that night. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote on the motion to postpone to the meeting of August 11th. Ms. Kennedy? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson? Yes. Mr. Perez for Dia. Yes. That, uh, that motion passes 11 to 0. We now have before us item 11C, ordinance number AO 2020-55, an ordinance amending Anchorage Municipal Code chapter 12.45, rental tax on rental of motor vehicles. Thank you. Madam Clerk, uh, what's the motion on the floor? There is no motion pending, Mr. Chair. What is the will of the body? Move to postpone until 825. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. LaFrance. Mr. Weddleton? Um, I, I know we've kicked this around for a while, and we had a work session on Friday, which I apologize I couldn't make. Um, but there's... Um, couple things we, we uh, th a couple things that have concerned me on this and and I've um, I think we've all had contacts from some people who do it and then some of the operators from Turo and the um, RV and so on have been contacting us and I've spoken with them a couple times and I spoke with them today and one thing they pointed out um, is um, Jerry Mackey who has been very active in this and I think he spoke on Friday he's called I believe all of us and emailed us and essentially lobbied us on behalf of Enterprise and he's not signed up as a lobbyist for the municipality so that would make that inappropriate and I don't know the legal nuances but it feels bad um, but there is a um, properly certified or licensed or whatever permitted lobbyist for Turo and he feels like he has not gotten a fair hearing. He's not sat down and even talked on the phone with the administration. And I've found, as you probably have too, that they're very approachable. I mean, they've been emailing us, and I, of course, we'd all been busy, so this afternoon, before this comes up, I emailed back and said, I'm at my desk now, give me a call. And in 10 minutes, I had a conference call with three or four of them, and they had productive comments. So. I had a fairly simple amendment that I said, well, would this work? Could you handle this with your computer programs? And, and they said they could, but they sent back a, a list of other things that aren't, um, don't really change the impact of this ordinance, but would put it more in the vernacular and in the format that they work with. So it would really just get it, uh, make it better. You know, So they're the ones who it will impact, and it should really be in the format that they can function under. But that wasn't done. So you know and I think they have a legitimate beef that why weren't we included and um, so I think if we can encourage the administration to give them a call 
talk to them and try to get some of these definitions tightened up and so on, that we can have that done by the 25th. And partly I had some amendments ready, but I, after talking to them, I realized they're not quite ready. Mine wouldn't work based on what, uh, partly the administration here, or our side, but also on their side, just because uh, it's, a, it's a tricky thing. And, and one of the amendments was just to say, if someone's got one vehicle and they're only renting it occasionally, um, it's very casual and just let someone, and then I think of it as like an incubator for innovation. You know, they're starting off their business and once they get maybe a few extra cars, they're in the real rental business and they start paying the tax. So um, I just think a little bit more time. And I know that we have been told that that is their strategy, to keep delaying it. Um, well, th we've lived without this for the entire duration of the car rental tax, and we can delay another month and get it right. And I'd rather have it right than have it done in a hurry. Thank you. Ms. Zolotel, on the motion to postpone? Yeah, question for Mr. Weddleton, please. Um, would, are the their suggested changes, you say, they don't really alter the ultimate outcome, but they just refine it? Is, and so would there be any, um, I guess, is there any significant issue with going back and making those refinements after moving forward with this? Um, actually, I, um, I got their um, email with the refinements or whatever during our meeting, so I haven't read it close enough to look. Dean has seen it, and he also says, well, he's playing with it, so he's not done. So I, I guess I can't say it didn't make any changes. It didn't appear to to me. But I think we that it's kind of odd to pass something and then four weeks later bring it back and pass it again. It's like, let's just do it, you know, and if it... Um, I mean, what are you telling, I mean, you know, the finance department, are they supposed to start setting up, but in four weeks they may have to change it? That just, I don't think that would sit for Mr. Slivka even. It would just be a little awkward. But that's a question for him, I guess. Is that Mr. Slivka? Yes, through the chair. Um, the administration would, post, would oppose a further delay. Um, we provided in a work session to the assembly uh, a fairly detailed outreach that the Treasury Department has made to Turo over the past several months. Um, and we would characterize uh, Turo's strategy, as Mr. Weddleton uh, correctly uh, said as delay. Um, there is nothing wrong with the language of this bill. It is very straightforward. It parallels exactly what we did with Airbnb. It is an attempt to um, bring citizens of Anchorage who are currently breaking the law into compliance easily, and it levels the playing field. It does not tax the citizens. It taxes the people who rent the vehicles. Um, uh, the treasurer uh, is on the phone to answer questions, and also if you have questions about the impact of Turo, um, Mike Schechter, who is a former attorney with uh, uh, State, uh, sorry, with uh, Ted Stevens International Airport, uh, can testify as to the impact that Turo has. Um, it's a business. These people who are renting their cars, they're renting cars, they're in the business. One car is in the business, and all we're asking is for a level playing field where everybody who rents a car, the people that rent the car, pay the tax as required by law. Um, and we would review a lot of what Toro has done. It's They bring stuff in at that very last minute and just ask for a delay. Um, we have answered all the arguments. We have reached out to them repeatedly. And we just find their tactics to be uh, disingenuous. Anything further, Ms. Zolito? Mr. Constant? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Slivka, what is the rental tax rate? Um, through the chair, the rental tax rate is 8%. So just a little bit of mental exercise here, and don't trust my math. Um, if we have $100,000 of re revenues by this company or one of these companies, this is one of the amendments before us, and assume it's 10% because the owner of the car is going to get their share, then that say it's a million dollars, 8% of a million dollars is actually quite a bit of money that we're not going to collect, that we would be generally collecting from anyone who rents a car in the municipality. And so I think it's not insignificant, the amount that is being uh, missed here, and that's just for one company that would be exempted under one of these amendments. Um, I don't I know that right. I support 
the delay or that I support these amendments even. Um, the matter has definitely been before us. It seems like a reasonable approach. We're already charging this tax and we're just giving people a way to pay it that is effective as opposed to some self-reporting that, as we all know, will never happen. So I think I'm in alignment with the administration. Thank you. Mr. Dunbar and the motion to postpone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I, I have a, a couple of questions that I think will determine whether or not I support the motion to postpone. And it goes to this, the amendment number two that Mr. Weddleton has put in the packet here. Um, and, and I think it kind of gets to the, the heart of the question. Perhaps I'm misunderstanding what the administration is trying to do. I thought you were trying to do what we did with Airbnb, which was go to the central hosting platform, this basically a tech company that does this thing, and say, pay these taxes on behalf of all these users, which is I, I understand to be what we did with VRBO and with Airbnb. So each individual you know, person renting an Airbnb didn't have to pay their own taxes. It would be centralized in that way. I thought that's what we were doing here, that, that Turo was going to be paying it. And yet if you look at the, the amendment number two, which I assume that um, Turo worked with Mr. Weddleton on, I don't think Mr. Weddleton um, brought it up him, himself. I'm sorry, he's, he's not by his microphone right now. But it talks about individuals with total revenues uh, below $3,600 a year are not required to register in persons renting a motor vehicle tax. But that shouldn't be relevant at all. The individual isn't the point. It's the hosting platform. And if so if Turo is making this argument and having Mr. Weddleton put it forward, and again, I do not blame Mr. Weddleton at all. We, we constantly are asked to put forward amendments. But if that is the case, then Turo is basically trying to uh, get around the tax completely and and sort of um, get around the idea of the tax and that, and thus not have an equal footing with the rental car companies here in Anchorage. So my question is, what part of that am I misunderstanding, uh, Ms. Vogel or Ms. S Mr. Slifka? Um, through the chair, so the first part of the question, you are correct. The purpose of this is to treat Toro the same way that we treat Airbnb. Uh, the second part of the question, we, we find the suggested de minimis uh, amendment is impractical and, 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 and unable to um, be implemented because if you think about it, you have to collect the tax. And so then are you going to wait all year to find out if you collect enough tax? Um, these companies do not give us the detail on who they collected the tax from. And then are we really going to take tax that was collected from an individual and then give it back to somebody that doesn't belong to when the law that the voters passed said that everybody who rents a car pays the tax to the municipality. So uh, we find that particular suggested amendment to be unworkable. And can I ask a quick follow-up, Mr. Chair? Sure, but we're getting a little bit out of the scope of the motion to postpone. But if you have a quick one. Well, I don't, th I don't think it's outside the scope because we're, we're, why are we postponing? Well, we're postponing so we can consider these amendments or different changes and Turo's ideas. Well, if this is Turo's idea um, and it basically obviates the tax, then I, I don't support a motion to postpone. I, I think we should vote on it tonight. And, and so I, I guess that... My question to the administration is again, amendment number two, is this, do you see this as part of Turo's sort of tactics? And have you seen it elsewhere and does it essentially nullify the tax? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I would ask Mr. Weddleton to maybe state the source of where he came up with the suggestion. I actually am not going to ask that question, Mr. Welton. I don't think it's appropriate. Uh, if you want to answer, fine, but that's not a question no, for I, me. It's you're, you're above reproach in my mind. No, I, I th no, I have um, th I, point of order. I, I think there are two amendment twos out there, and they're different. And I don't have one version. And I know, um, and I think the issue that Mr. Dunbar is bringing up, that hundred thousand dollar issue, I don't have a copy of that. That was one of the things they had emailed and. To, and that was something that came during the meeting. I haven't had time to evaluate it. But their point was to create a clear nexus, to, given the Wayfair um, case, to create a clear nexus between them and our taxing ability. So they had proposed a $100,000 so, threshold. But I think there's this, this one's for $3,600. It's, it's the C individual the total revenues for vehicle renters okay. below $3,600. Yeah, so where's this 100000 come from? Because that was another issue that it's they in had our brought emails. up. 
Okay. Uh, hold on, folks. So, um, did you have anything further, Mr. Dunbar? Well, I, I guess now I'm now I'm a little curious, Mr. Weldon. Did, did you mean to put forward this thirty-six hundred dollar amendment? Yes, but Chris Constant has something different. It says. Okay. Is I'm that sorry. right, Chris? It's, so, Mr. Chair, Mr. Gates did send us all an email that has an additional amendment. Okay, so that's obviously not something that we have printed before okay. us. It's just in our email. Is that an amendment that you would like us to consider, Mr. Weddleton? I have not seen it. I can't say. I have not checked my email during the meeting but once. Okay. But this is, I think this is my point, is that um, now perhaps they're delaying, but, but I emailed and said, well, call me at my desk. Ten minutes later, they call and They say, well, the administration hasn't called them. Now, the administration has given us a list of their attempts to contact them, but one was a letter that went to the wrong address. And, you know, there's a variety of issues with it. Um, but we should get this right. And, and part of that thing with the thing that Chris Constant's looking at is, is they wanted to make sure there was a clear nexus. No, don't pass that out if it's okay. Which one are you doing? Well, I want to make sure it's... Um, Oh, this is the three. Um, okay, so that was what Mr. Constant was looking at was number three, which I have not seen until now. So, but that's kind of why it's a let's delay it. Let's look at these things and see if they have merit. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Vogel? Yeah, so I think some of these things uh, are uh, red herrings, but if there was a desire to make certain changes, then figuring out the best way to make those changes might take more time. Um, uh, so the legal department has given you analysis on why Wayfair isn't the end-all be-all of this analysis. Um, essentially that's a way that we can get a nexus to tax uh, a company like Wayfair which sells home goods to people via the internet uh, or a way to tax an Amazon um, where they're selling a product. That's not what we have here. We have a tax that already does apply within the municipality to these car rentals because there's a car rental happening within the municipality. The problem is we have a hosting platform or a company coming in and um, interrupting the flow of the money. They're intercepting the money from the uh, person who's renting it and they aren't paying the tax on behalf of the owner of the car. And so there's tax evasion happening rampantly uh, via use of this platform. So we don't really need the Wayfair hook of, do we, do we have a law that says um, Toro by itself has enough nexus uh, with, uh, with this community? Uh, already Toro has a problem in that what it's doing is encouraging uh, renters to to evade taxes uh, by making it quite difficult for them to actually be able to pay those taxes. So, yes, this does do. This is the Airbnb equivalent. But the notion that we need to hang our hat on Wayfair or be overly concerned with it, it's not an analogous situation. And then, additionally, I, I really think that they're misconstruing Wayfair. We've given you that analysis. We gave it to you on Friday in the work session. Um, it's also. Uh, uh, in your, your inboxes uh, written down today. I, I think that they're pointing out some things that were not holdings in Wayfair about the tax uh, that the court upheld in Wayfair, but it, it wasn't the holding, so we don't need to duplica duplicate those elements. So I think that uh, I, I agree with Mr. Weddleton that if certain changes are desired by this body, uh, figuring out the mechanics of those changes will probably uh, take some additional work. But in the absence of wanting those changes, uh, then I, I'm, I'm not sure that, uh, that more time is needed in terms of uh, the, the mechanics of what's going on here. Um, thank, yeah. thank you. Um, I don't want us to uh, belabor this point too much. So uh, Mr. Weddleton, and then I have Ms. Quinn Davidson. Okay, um, so looking at number three now, and, and I agree with Mr. Constant, when I had looked at their email and saw that high threshold, uh, Dean and I had talked and says, well, do we have to stick with that number and, and kind of the discussion that Ms. Vogel brought up um, had come out. And I haven't read her email yet because I haven't checked my email during the meeting, but once. So, um, anyway, so this is here kind of based on what they'd sent, but I would not offer this as appropriate, and I wouldn't say that 100,000 threshold makes any sense at all. I mean, I, you can do the math that Chris did, and it seems quite high. So, um, 
but that's kind of, you know, if we don't need a nexus with Wayfair, then that doesn't have to be part of it. But it was the kind of thing that, um, that's what a delay would do. We should make sure about those things and get it right. And it could be we don't have to. And now we have opinion from Ms. Vogel that may be there. Um, so, um, I don't know. I think I'm ready to vote, but. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I was just going to say that I think it's pretty clear that um, the tactic is to wait, 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 email us at the last minute, and then ask us to delay and attempt to confuse us. And um, we've received sound legal advice, and I do not think we should postpone. We should move forward tonight. Thank you. With that, members may proceed to vote on the motion to postpone. Ms. Kennedy. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. No. Mr. Perez Verdia. No. Mr. Peterson. Yes. That motion fails eight to three. With that, um, move to approve. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Second. Moved and seconded. I'd like to move Weddleton Amendment number one. Mm -hmm. okay. Moved and seconded by Ms. Kennedy. Mr. Weddleton. Uh, to give it greater credibility, this does not truly come from me. This comes more from Dean and the administration. Um, this is to delete uh, section one, page three, beginning at line two. Um, in a closer look at the ballot language, when the rental vehicle tax was passed, it shows that the cap on the tax is um, part of the agreement with voters. And we can't it would essentially be raising taxes. We can't do that without another vote. So section um, one has to go away. Thank you. Is it section one or two? Section two is what I'm seeing in your amendment. It is section two. Mr. Constant? Yeah, I just heard the comment that Mr. Weddleton made about uh, credibility from the administration. And I just want to reiterate what Mr. Dunbar said that, Mr. Weddleton, I find you above reproach. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. Ms. Kennedy. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Peterson. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Oh, I'm sorry, no. No, I meant to vote no. This is on the amendment, right? Correct. This is on amendment number one. Yeah, yeah no. Mr. Perez Verdia? Sorry, that clear clarification. This is on, on the amendment, right? This is amendment number one. Assemblymember Weddleton, Amendment Number One to delete Section right. Two. Thank you for the clarification. I don't know. They can't vote no. It's illegal. That amendment passes nine to two. So. Okay. Will you be bringing forward any other amendments, Mr. Weddleton? I will do Amendment um, Four. Amendment Number Four. Move amendment number four. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. LaFrance. Mr. Whittleton? Uh, this uh, delay comes from the administration um, <laughs> to delay the effective date. I'm sure it makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> We're just carrying the water. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dunbar. Could, I, I think there might have. I think there might have been some confusion on the last amendment too. So could the administration just briefly explain why they want this? Yeah, yeah through the chair. Um, we requested this because uh, in conversations with uh, Mr. Gates, it's quite clear that the ballot language um, contains a cap. So we requested and thank Mr. Weddleton for putting forth the amendment to remove that cap because we cannot um, remove it by what was in the proposed ordinance. So. We are asking that it be removed, and thank you for passing that 
um, mm -hmm. amendment. And, and again, in the same fashion, we're suggesting we push out implementation to October 1st, just because we've been delayed so long in our discussions. Thank you. Mr. perez -Bridia? Thank you. I'm, I, I apologize. I'm having a hard time hearing and following. So, uh, the, I, and I was having a hard time hearing um, the last speaker. What is this? What can you? Can someone reiterate what this uh, amendment does? Mr. Weddleton? Uh, okay. The one we're on now, um, Cameron, simply changes the effective date to October first at the request of the administration. And what that is the is cap? A, That's what I'm trying That to. was amendment number one, which we already passed. Okay, I, I got that, okay, all right, thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion on amendment number four, members, members may proceed to vote. Yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. That amendment passes 11 to 0. Any further amendments, Mr. Weddleton? Uh, no, thank you, everyone. We now have the main motion before us. Any discussion? Mr. Constant. Yeah, I just would simply say that fair is fair. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. Is this on the main body? On the main motion, I'd yeah. like to actually speak for a moment. Um, and, and I'm not opposed to this. I think in people renting, they should pay, you know. And I think as we kind of dove into this, I mean, there are some people who have quite a number of vehicles that are taking advantage of these online hosts and essentially running regular rental businesses and not paying the tax and that's simply not fair. I, I had hoped to set a, a minimum so if someone's got one vehicle that they rent and what I heard is on average is about $300 a month people do so it's fairly small but it's very helpful to those people to pay for their vehicle or whatever it is. Um, it uses a vehicle more efficiently, it helps other people not have to own a vehicle. I mean this is kind of the world we should be looking at, right? And we say well they don't pay the 8%, the, the user pays the 8%. Well, most of that is locals renting from locals. And that 8% raises the price of their product. Whoever pays it, it's 8% more costly. And I think at these lower levels, it is kind of nice to just let them have a little bit, ha let them have that 8% and maybe grow into a full-fledged rental. And we have more competition in rentals. I mean, that's a good thing. You know? so, um, so I'd hope to have, and that's what you saw in Amendment 2, which they didn't move, because without time to really work on it, um, we couldn't get it in a way where it would actually function properly um, with both our team and the um, various online hosts to get it so it would work. So I, I'm disappointed in that. But overall, I mean, th I think this is something we have to do. Um, as far as even playing field, um, you know, the um, rental car companies apparently don't pay registration on other vehicles. But if you're an individual doing yours, you did. So there are some things. It's not quite equality. So I was looking for some balance in that. And... Uh, um, could have got there, but that's okay. I think this is a good ordinance and we should do this. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I think that Mr. Dunbar raised this at the work session, but I just wanted to remind everyone that I believe this is under the tax cap. And so if we do not pass this ordinance, that which would require that folks pay their fair share, that means property owners' taxes would be higher. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to put that out to everyone. You're not making a choices about, like, you know, pro or con against taxes. It's whether you want everyone to pay or property owners to pay more. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Allard? Thank you. And I'm, I'm not always about higher taxes. Let me, I'll be honest with you. But I will say, Mr. Weddleton, one of the things that I've done is I've actually rented a car from Turo down in the lower 48, and we paid taxes. And I believe fair is fair. And I understand it does supplement... Um, person's ability to pay their vehicle, but they can still pay their vehicle even with a little bit of an 8% hit. I do appreciate what, you know, trying to help people out, but fair is fair on this one. Thank you. Thank you. 
With that, members may proceed to vote. Ms. Kennedy. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yeah. That passes 11 to 0. We now have before us item 14A, Emergency Ordinance Number EO 2020-5, an emergency ordinance providing financial resources for labor supplies and other expenditures required to address municipal response to coronavirus disease Wait, 19. Waiting. Thank you. 2019, excuse me. Um, let's see, do we have anyone? Uh, we have uh, Mr. Haberman to testify. Welcome to the voicemail of. Okay. Um, I don't think we have anyone else on the list to testify, so I'm going to go ahead and close public testimony. What is the will of the body? Moved to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion on this item? Seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Ms. Kennedy. Yeah. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yeah. That item passes 11 to zero. We now have before us item 14B, uh, AO number, uh, 2020-76, an ordinance of the Anchorage Assembly imposing a moratorium on evictions of residential tenants who experience financial hardship related to the COVID-19 pandemic for non-payment of rent. We will go ahead and try Mr. Haberman again and see if he answers this time. Hi, Mr. Haberman. We are on item 14B. Um, this is Felix Severia with the Anchorage Assembly. We're on public testimony. Um, I have three minutes on the timer. Uh, welcome. Oh, did he hang up? Mr. Haberman? Uh, let's try him one more time. Mr. Haberman, can you hear me? Is there any reason he wouldn't be able to hear me? <laughs> We're probably all good. <laughs> uh, let's hang up and try one more time. Hi, Mr. Haberman, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Great. Uh, we, are are you on item, we are on item 14B. Um, I have you signed up to testify. You have three what? minutes. Welcome. What happened to 2020-5? Is that 14? We are on item 14B. We tried to call you on item 14A, and it, went to, it rang, and it went to voicemail. Well, that, I was, I, excuse me, but my phone, I have my phone, I'm listening to a meeting, and no ring came through, and you never tried a second time. 
So, I have other Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Haberman, but um, we did attempt to call you, and, it did, to and it did you go to voicemail. Um, would you like to testify on item 14B, sir? 14B? Yes. Is, what's the title of the one? Yeah, uh, item 14B is related to the eviction moratorium. Okay, let me start my poll. Great, go ahead. The fact is, you only, you pay it. One, two, three. Okay, my name is Eugene Colonel Hickman. I started the timer on that one. With all due respect, you had, I'm in this and attending to your meetings, and you just started public hearings, the first and second one, and I'm clear to connecting to what you're saying on the other step. But in the agenda you had, dealing with the eviction and discussions and all that stuff. And here you make decisions in that consent agenda, and then you have an item for public hearings on evictions in this one. And you make decisions on evictions where the public cannot even speak or have a clue to what you got, but you so many laid on the table items. So, with all the respect, you made only one time check to get me on that first one, and then we didn't try a second time, and there's a problem. You need to, I signed up, I've been listening to me the entire time, and I should have a right and should get a fair chance that people are connected. Because I see numerous times that people are not getting a chance with this telephonic thing. And with a COVID thing, you need more of a chance. My God, it's terrible. So you need to give, you need to give a chance to, I never call in and give me a chance to speak on that other one. Because on this eviction thing, it was like the other one, you basically make decisions for several hours on the same issues, and then you're asking for public comment on a separate on an ordinance thing, and you use the other things as resolutions and stuff like that, like on the eviction thing. And, and the public does not see this stuff on the eviction stuff because it's put a weight on the table and the items and addendums and... You've been told so many times about process and process at the episode you dealt with the CARES Act thing and four different public hearings before. And what have you done? You showed yourself as, as business as usual. So you need to continue public hearing. You need to make a better effort for the public to be heard. And note this for the record. I witnessed the thing about when you use telephonics, you don't ask questions generally to people on the phone but you ask a lot of questions, those in physically in the room, and now you've got a situation where the public's not in that room, so you're not likely not going to ask any questions to people on the phone. And I guess that my time must be up on it, 29 seconds to spare. But I agree with you. Let the public speak on that issue and realize one effort to call in, and no phone call rang in to me. And I'm holding my phone, this is your meeting. What are you going to do with that? Be fair? Are you going to be business as usual? And so I tell the people they have not a chance to address this issue or any other issue. With seven seconds to spare. Thank you for your testimony. With that, that is everyone signed up to testify on this item. Public uh, testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, any discussion? Mr. Weddleton. I'd like to offer two uh, small amendments, and I'm sorry I don't have anything written up. Okay. Uh, the first would be on page one. At the end of, add to the sentence that ends on line 43, and work with the landlord to prepare a written payment plan. Second. Moved and seconded by Mr. Constant. Did you get that? Okay. Do you want to speak to that one? Well, it's pretty simple. I think what this says is uh, if someone doesn't have any money, they've got to go to the landlord and say, hey, I can't make rent. And this just says, and let's write something up and say, oh, here's what we'll do. And they agree to something. Thank you. Mr. Constant. Uh, Ms. Alatul, do you want to speak to the amendment? Yes, please. Um, actually, I, th I think that's a good idea. Um, previously, when there was an eviction moratorium, there had been a form um, that had been cooperatively created with the court system. And I'm wondering, um, and it kind of 
it got to this point. And so I'm wondering if ultimately that doesn't just kind of cut to the chase. You kind of give your reason and you're going to have to try to work with your um, landlord. Um, I think I'll try to get at the back end of the queue and see if I can't dig that up really quick to see if we could possibly even just be more clear and make direct reference to the possibility of the form. Thank you. Um, Mr. Dunbar, did you want to speak? Uh, actually, before I get to you, um, can you restate the amendment, please, Madam Clerk? Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, it is too oh, we need it in the microphone for the folks on the phone. <laughs> the amendment is to add the language and work with the landlord to develop a written payment plan. And where is that added at? I would love it if Mr. Weddleton would remind me where that is. Uh, that goes on the, is attached to the end of the sentence that ends on line 43 of page one. Okay. Uh, Mr. Dunbar, did you want to speak to the amendment? Yes, but tied to the overall um, effort. I, I, I support the amendment assuming we have the legal authority to do this whole thing. And so I want to hear from the administration about that because I was under the impression, perhaps I'm mistaken, the municipality does not have the legal authority to declare this kind of moratorium. And if that's the case, then we're going to confuse a hell of a lot of people if we pass this. We're going to say, there's a rent, there's a, there's a rent moratorium, but that's not actually the law. But maybe I'm wrong, maybe we do have this authority. And so I'd like to hear from the administration if that's the case. Ms. Through, Vogel? Yeah. Through the chair, uh, Assembly Member Dunbar, um, I don't think the municipality has the power to uh, enact this ordinance. The logic is um, we have a state statute uh, which provides uniform landlord and tenant law, and it uh, uh, it has as one of the provisions of the law that it, uh, and, and one of the purposes to be uniform law within the state. It also gives rights between, as between landlords and tenants. So it's hard to have concurrent jurisdiction with that law and then um, take away a right that the landlord has under the law in looking at what jurisdictional hooks we might nonetheless have available uh, th the next thing to look at for um, an eviction moratorium is what courts are they going to if they were coming to a municipal court we could just say hey guess what uh, eviction should not be your priority right now court um, but they they do not uh, go to a municipal court we don't have a municipal court they go to state court and then um, it, it's hard for me to imagine how in state court, when someone is going to vindicate a state right, uh, how exactly this municipal ordinance would come into play to change the judge's analysis there. Um, a last ditch effort uh, to get a jurisdictional hook on this might be, well, if all evictions are enforced through uh, APD or municipal uh, power in some way, we could just withhold that resource in this time of COVID emergency. And uh, it, it, that's not how it works. Um, there, uh, I, I think most evictions are probably enforced without uh, police present. I mean, they're certainly not police presence, but without um, peace officer presence. But what peace officer presence there is comes from the court system and not from APD. So. I don't see a, a, a way that this is enforceable. Um, and I think it, I also don't think that it necessarily will exist for a long time uh, because this is immediately brought, in order for an eviction to happen, it sort of immediately happens in a state court, at which point uh, if someone was to bring up this ordinance, uh, it, it's, the, the applicability of it is sort of right there, front and center the first time that that comes up. So. Um, that's my analysis on uh, whether we can do this. 
Thank you. Um, so I'm going to oppose the amendment because I don't intend to vote for the underlying ordinance, but I really wish I could, and I wish we had this legal authority, and I hope that the governor and the legislature do do this, and I appreciate Mr. Rivera for consistently bringing these kind of ordinances and resolutions that center renters and vulnerable communities to us, but I do not think we have the legal authority to do this, regrettably. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Rivera. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, yeah, Mr. Dunbar beat me to the punch a little bit. And um, so there are uh, two uh, legal opinions, which, you know, you know, when you get two lawyers to agree, you're probably on the wrong side. Um, so both Ms. Vogel and Mr. Gates uh, agree and have the same determination. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure that we necessarily need to amend this item to death. Um, but uh, I'm happy to speak to the, the merits of it once we're done amending this item. I will say I will support this amendment um, because it aligns uh, well with the other resolution that was passed earlier today uh, in which we are asking all of the parties to work well together. Thank you, Mr. Rivera. Uh, Ms. Allard on the amendment. Um, so at what point can I phone a friend? I know, but I really think that people need to hear um, what my phone a friend has to say because it gives a little bit more insight, not maybe just because it's not legal, and that's possibly why the state's not doing it, but it could give a little bit more perspective on how the landlords are being affected. Is that a, are you okay with that, Chair? Um, yes, but I just want to make sure we're doing it at the right time. So this is, an, this is an, an amendment. So Let me know, and we can do it when okay. you're ready. Thank you. Great. Um, I'll leave you in the queue for that. Mr. Constant, on the amendment? Uh, actually, get, take me out of the queue. Okay. Um, C no, and Mr. Dunbar, did you want to stay in the queue? No? Okay. Um, seeing no further discussion, uh, members may proceed to vote on the amendment. Ms. Kennedy? Yeah. Mr. Peterson? Mr. Peterson? Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson? Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia? Yes. That amendment passes 10 to 1. So, Nettleton. <laughs> uh, Ms. Allard? I'm good. If we postpone indefinitely, I'm fine. Well, let's have, just in case it passes, I'd like to add another amendment. <laughs> now I'll try to do it quickly. Could. Well, they, okay, then in case it passes, I guess I need to phone a friend. Sure, yeah. Let, let's go ahead and, and do the right procedure here. So go ahead, Ms. Allen. Uh, do I need to give the number to somebody? Yeah, if you can go ahead, write it down and give it to Mr. Turner. Okay. So are we on an amendment, or where, where are we, Mr. Chair? So uh, Ms. Allard is um, ringing up someone that she would like to ask a question of. Okay. Uh, it's up to you, Ms. Allard. Um, this is Felix Rivera. You're with the Anchorage Assembly. Um, I think you might have a TV, if you can turn mute on that. Um, I think I have, uh, Ms. Allard has some questions for you. Hi, Thank you very much, and I have muted it. Can you hear me just for a moment? Hi, Ms. Taggart. I have some um, questions for you, and I'm going to, I'm going to ask you. So here's the first one. Let's see what have any of the landlords been experiencing squatters on their premises? Yes, 
um, multiple stories. Well, Tiger, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can you just um, state who you are as far as your position? I apologize. Ms. Taggart, can you just explain who you're, who, what your position is and what you do? Yes. My name is Cassandra Taggart. I am a broker for real property management. I also host a club called the Landlord's Almanac. Real property management helps around 500 rental properties in the Anchorage Borough. And then the Landlord's Almanac, it does around 3,000 landlords in the Anchorage Borough area and that too. Thank you. So if you can go ahead and answer or uh, ask, uh, answer the first question I asked, are your landlords experiencing squatters? Yes, um, many are, and I personally, out of my 500 rentals, do have squatters as well that I'm faced with. Are any of your landlords working with tenants? Many are. Very few in my hearing are just up and evicting. Do you have any statistics? I do. Um, on the statistics, uh, based on everything I could gather, we're only looking at about 10% of people that are doing slow or non-paying. Most are entering into payment arrangements. Um, what I do also have to say is that the funds, the million dollars fund that the money has done, has been a big support of helping get a lot of the people paid, and those checks did start arriving in the last two weeks for us. It was a huge relief for them, and we were very excited to hear it. Um, so speaking on behalf of my customers, they were very appreciative. Um, also, just to say what's fair is fair. Um, if the city wants to share in the burden, just so you know, we're looking at about $26 million of dollars that is on a burden if this passes to landlords. Uh, landlords are willing to carry some of the burden through payment plans. They're full in agreement with that. They're not in agreement of being able to use the right with the evictions or any other restrictions because there are situations that we can't create enough rules for to um, protect all people. Thank you. That will be it. Thanks, Ms. Taggart. Understood. Thank you. Chair, can I follow up with you? Sure, so I ahead. just wanted to bring her into the phone call because I wanted to reassure folks who are sitting here in the assembly and to the public that the landlords are working with tenants and they are trying to do, if they miss a uh, payment of any sort of their rents, that they're trying to stretch it out and they're, they're all working together as a community. And I just wanted to point that out. So even though it's not possibly legal, I appreciate you bringing it forward as well. But I just wanted to encourage and show that the community is working together. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. LaFrance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to move to postpone indefinitely. Second. Moved and seconded. Do you want to speak to that, Ms. LaFrance? Only that uh, since both attorneys have advised it's not legal, um, I'm uncomfortable supporting it, though I appreciate that you've brought forward this issue and that we passed the earlier resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. LaFrance, I mean, excuse me, Ms. Alatel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't oppose the motion to postpone indefinitely, but I will send the eviction, um, I'm sorry, the rent deferral and modification form back out through the clerk's office for everyone. It is an option for landlords and tenants to really get at uh, a lot of what Mr. Rivera was trying to do with this, and I do applaud that effort because two individuals to a contract, which is what a lease is, can, can choose to modify that, and it does have um, repayment plans built in. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Rivera. Thank you. So yeah, I'm going to speak because um, I think this will be my only opportunity on the motion to postpone indefinitely, but a little bit more generally. Um, yeah, so a little bit of, of the rationale of bringing this forward. So this is, per the resolution that we passed earlier today, one of several tactics that uh, we need to look at implementing. And absolutely, um, I agree and have heard that um, landlords are working with uh, tenants, but I think there are uh, uh, there's, there's much more that needs to happen. There's rental assistance, which we have already uh, funded $3 million. We may need to fund more in that. Um, there uh, is eviction moratoriums. There's making sure uh, that we're bringing everyone to the table, working with the court system. Um, there, there's a lot of work that needs to get done, and this is one of the, the crucial pieces to it. Um, a, a study that was done by a Colorado-based um, group of experts 
uh, stated that one in five renters uh, could possibly be facing evictions if we do nothing. And um, unfortunately, that has been uh, the uh, MO of the state right now when it comes to eviction moratoriums. Neither the legislature nor the governor um, have acted on this, even though many have asked them to do so. And um, so if the governor is not going to act on this and if the legislature is not going to act on this, then uh, I uh, believe that we need to act on this. And so I'm going to be voting no on this motion to postpone indefinitely. Thank you, Mr. Rivera. Thank you. With that, uh, members may proceed to vote. Yes. Oh, excuse me. Ms. Quinn Davidson? Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank you for bringing this forward. I really appreciated the debate earlier about the resolution. I think given the legal landscape, the resolution is the most appropriate path forward, and I'm really glad that we passed it. Um, and I certainly don't want to get in a battle with the state right now over uh, municipal power. So uh, I'll be voting yes. But I really do appreciate, like Mr. Dunbar said, your um, consistent and genuine efforts to help vulnerable people in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Kennedy? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I, I'm, um, I'm going to support the motion to postpone as well. And uh, I was uh, not going to support uh, this ordinance uh, uh, anyway. Um, but I did support the um, um, eviction tsunami resolution because there were things in that that I thought were really a whole lot more important than just the idea of having an, an eviction moratorium and you know that was the idea of boosting the rental assistance and um, and really working uh, to make sure that there was a, a better a more efficient distribution of those kinds of funds to people I thought that was really critical and um, for me I think that's our responsibility. And so uh, with the resolution, I was really glad that it mentioned, it wasn't just about picking on any one entity, but it mentioned all of us. You know, it's the state, it's the municipality, it's the assembly that has the ability to, to really um, deal with this um, potential crisis. And well, maybe it's already a crisis. But, um, but anyway, um, I, that's one reason why I wanted to support the resolution, but I couldn't support this particular ordinance. So um, uh, I'm glad that um, we did uh, pass the uh, resolution. I think what is really key to that is the idea that this also, the resolution at least acknowledged that landlords are kind of in this as well. I and mean, we have landlords who literally can't pay their rent either. So, and I say that because they're paying mortgages, they're paying utility bills. Um, we have some very small landlords who own duplexes or fourplexes, and um, you know, and they're having just as much of a difficulty. When we put in the idea of a moratorium, it was really going to, I think, hamper a lot of those efforts where landlords have legitimate reasons for uh, maybe needing to evict someone, and we certainly don't want to go to the point of um, keeping that from happening when there really are in some cases, destructive people uh, in, in, a, in a particular facility. But anyway, so um, I do appreciate the effort in this. But again, I think it comes back to us. We have a lot of money that we can be putting toward um, all kinds of rental assistance and mortgage relief. And I think that's exactly what we should be doing with our funding, is making sure that we're making things happen, not just writing resolutions and waiting for the state or anybody else to do something, we have the ability to do it. And that's what I want to see us uh, really work on. So um, thank you. Thank you. With that, members may proceed to vote. Ms. Kennedy. Yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. That motion to postpone indefinitely passes 10 to 1. 
Uh, we now have before us item 14C, ordinance number AO 2020-69, an ordinance of the municipality of Anchorage, Alaska, authorizing and providing for the issuance of not to exceed 72, 72 million in aggregate principal amount of general obligation school bonds of the municipality for the purpose of financing the cost of educational capital improvements for district Wait, reading. wide major building systems renewal. Thank you. Uh, we do not have anyone to testify on this item. Public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Ms. Kennedy. Yeah. Mr. Peterson. Yeah. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yeah. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yeah. That item passes 11 to 0. We now have before us item 14D, ordinance number AO 2020-72, an ordinance of the municipality of Anchorage, Alaska, authorizing and providing for the issuance of not to exceed 52 million in aggregate principal amount of general obligation general purpose bonds of the municipality for the purpose of financing the costs of road and drainage improvements, renovating, replacing, and renewing park facilities, public safety and transportation improvements, police and fire improvements, and related capital improvement projects. We're reading. Thank you. We do not have anyone to testify on this item. Public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion on this item? Seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Ms. Kennedy. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yeah. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yeah. Mr. Constant. That item passes 11 to 0. We now have before us item 14E, ordinance number AO 2020-77, an ordinance of the municipality of Anchorage, Alaska, amending op ordinance number 2019-86 to allow for issuance of taxable general obligation refunding bonds of the municipality. We don't have anyone to testify on this item. Public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion on this item? Seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Ms. Kennedy. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. That item passes 11 to 0. We now have before us item 14F, resolution number AR 2020-229, resolution of the municipality of Anchorage, reappropriating an amount not to exceed 535,934 general obligation bond proceeds from the Anchorage Police Department roof replacement project to the APD boilers, valves, and fittings replacement project within APD headquarters. We reading. Thank you. Uh, we do not have anyone to testify on this item. Public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion on this item? Ms. Allard. Just wanted to, you know, this is going to be in my audit committee meeting that I'm going to look to hold on the August the 6th, and we've reached out to the clerk's office, and we'll get a response, I'm sure, within the next few days. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. Ms. Kennedy. Yeah. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yeah. Mr. Perez Verdia. Mr. Perez Verdia? That item passes 10 to 0. We now have before us item 14G, resolution number AR 2020-244, a resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly approving deteriorated property tax exemption and tax deferral under Anchorage Municipal Code Chapter 12.35 
for improvements that will undergo substantial renovation on the east half of lot 9A, block 41. Wave reading. Thank you. Um, we do have uh, two individuals to testify on this item. Uh, first, we have Mr. Tim Potter. Welcome to the Audio Conferencing Center. Please enter a conference ID followed by pound. Welcome to the Audio Conferencing Center. Please. You're now joining the meeting. Hi, Mr. Potter. Yes. Hi, this is Felix Rivera. You're with the Anchorage Assembly. I understand that you have a group of folks on a conference line, but one of you will be testifying. Uh, one or two of us will be testifying. We have uh, Joan Maria Fang, uh, Derek Chang, Terrence Chang, uh, Barbara Simpson Craft, um, local council, and myself. Okay, uh, I'm going to go ahead and um, set three minutes for uh, the first individual. If you can have them introduce themselves, please. Uh, what um, What I would like to do is just. Uh, simply say that we've worked uh, diligently um, with the administration and with the uh, municipal CFO. His uh, write-up and report to you is very concise, uh, captures all of the points. Uh, I'm very excited about this opportunity to put a new face on a 50-year-old building, uh, expand the building, and turn it into the future of, uh, of downtown. Um, it's something that this community needs. Uh, it needs some reinvestment in downtown, uh, and this is the project to do it. It's uh, very close in proximity to a variety of municipally owned uh, buildings uh, and kitty corner from Town Square Park and, and should be a real benefit. I would like to have Barbara Simpson Craft um, speak a little bit, and then we'll be available for uh, any questions. Thank you. This is Barbara Simpson Craft at Davis Wright Tremaine Local Council to the property owner. This is an opportunity for the public private partnership envisioned by AMC 1235 to be used to help uh, push a project over the finish line to become financially feasible, which is a requirement of AMC 1235. Um, Mr. Slipka has worked diligently through the financial information to determine that the property qualifies and the um, work that is to be done on this building I believe there are um, photos and or information that was shared earlier um, the property owner is eager to get started on this project but needs these tax incentives the deferral period and the exemption period in order to make the project feasible if this is approved, the contract will be signed with the contractor and work will go forward to remodel, to complete and remodel the building. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Go it's, ahead. It's very important to, to note that um, not only is this a, uh, a benefit by having a uh, effectively new building created, that will expand the existing old bank building, re-skin it, redo the entire interior, upgrade all the infrastructure, so effectively will be a new building. Um, there's also the benefit of 35 to 75 um, craftsmen working on the site uh, through the entire time period uh, that is being worked on, um, estimated to be 135,000 person hours 
um, of, of labor that will go into, uh, into this building alone. So uh, we'll stand by for any questions, and we urge your support and, and appreciate all the help that the administration's been. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for your testimony. I don't see any questions. Uh, next, we have uh, Miss Amanda Moser. Hi, Ms. Moser. This is Felix Rivera. Uh, you are with the Anchorage Assembly. We're on public testimony for item uh, 14G. Uh, you have three minutes. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening through the chair. My name is Amanda Moser, and I am the executive director of Anchorage Downtown Partnership. We are a nonprofit committed to a clean, safe, and vital downtown. Thank you for the opportunity to speak about AO 2020-244. Downtowns hold a unique space in our communities. They are the city center and they belong to everyone. In our downtown, we gather to celebrate and we come together to lift our voices to support a diverse, inclusive, and understanding community. A strong downtown is critical for a successful Anchorage. When you provide for downtown, the returns on investment benefit all of Anchorage because downtown belongs to everyone. Despite its relatively small share of Anchorage's overall geography, our downtown delivers significant economic and community impacts to both our city and Alaska. As the literal and figurative heart of Anchorage, our downtown represents and welcomes all residents, employees, and visitors from all walks of life. AO 2020-244 offers the opportunity to take an existing, almost 50-year-old building and fully renew it to new conditions with full structural updates, new building infrastructure, full moon finishes inside and the installation of a new building exterior. The result being a new, slightly larger, exciting building in our downtown core. This building is located next to our Performing Arts Center where our community gathers for the symphony and for the opera, celebrates the beginning of the holiday season with the Nutcracker, and encourages our Alaska's youth as they go head-to-head -head in the yearly Sunday. When we see buildings that are less vacant or underutilized, they can bring the various activity to those spaces, which has visible and long-term impacts on our community. This redevelopment provides an opportunity for vital and fresh energy to a space located close to Town Square Park and Cratchwich Park, where new and vibrant energy is desperately needed. During these uncertain times, I'd be remiss if I did not mention the importance of construction jobs for our local economy and the food that those jobs can put on the table and the assistance they can provide with paying the rent for our Alaskan workers. Thank you for your consideration. I strongly support the revitalization and redevelopment of our downtown through the passage of AO 2020-244. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your testimony. With that, uh, we don't have anyone else signed up to testify. Public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion on this item? Seeing none. Yeah, actually, Mr. Chair, one note. That I Go just, ahead, Mr. I Thompson. would just like to say that might have been the most concise testimony I've ever heard from Mr. Potter. Mm -hmm. I would like that on the record. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. It is on the record. Um, okay. Uh, seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. Ms. Kennedy. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson? Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia? Yes. The item passes 11 to 0. Uh, we now have item 14H, ordinance number AO 2020 67, an ordinance of the Anchorage Assembly amending Anchorage Municipal Code to update Chapter 17.20 to include a Board of Supervisors for the Homestead Limited Road Service Area. Wave reading. Thank you. We don't have anyone to testify on this item. Public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Moved, Moved to approve. approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion on this item? Ms. LaFrance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to um, thank the folks who have been serving on this board since they were originally appointed in uh, 2013. 
since Thank no you. elections have been held since or yet. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. Ms. Kennedy. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. Yeah. That item passes 11 to 0. We now have before us item 14I, ordinance number AO 2020 68. An ordinance authorizing a five-year lease with three five-year renewal options between the municipality of Anchorage and the state of Alaska to, for premises located in the state crime lab building. Wave reading. Thank you. We don't have anyone signed up to testify. Public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Ms. France. I also just wanted to comment that uh, this should be called the Fred Dyson Shared Crime Lab Agreement. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Constant. And on that note, I would just add it costs us a dollar, which fits very well with this theme. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Whoever negotiated that, that's a great deal. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. Ms. Kennedy. <laughs> yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yeah. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yeah. That item passes 11 to 0. We now have before us item 14J, ordinance number AO 2020 63, an ordinance amending the zoning map and approving the rezoning of approximately 9.91 acres from B3SL district with special limitations to B3 district for the north half of lot 2A, block 2, Mountain View subdivision. Wave reading. Thank you. We do have one individual to testify on this item, Mr. Kirk Rose. After you leave a message, you can modify. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and close public testimony. What is the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, Mr. Weddleton. Um, I, I think this just makes common sense, but since for a historical note, I was on the planning commission when we rezoned it to make it what we're on doing. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. <laughs> that made sense then, but we have a new code now. Conditions have changed. while uh, the clerk is um, getting that set up. Um, I understand from the clerk that in our 15 items, both 15A and 15C must be taken up today as they both have deadlines. So I'd make them we over window window window. We're not there yet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ms. Kennedy. Yeah. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. Mr. Dunbar. That item passes 11 to 0. Mr. Constant. Hey, I'd make a motion to change the order of the day to take up now 15A and 15C. I'd second. I'd like to modify that. Mm -hmm. uh, Sure, what do you have? Could, could we pick up all the 15s? Yes. A, B, and C. They'll go pretty fine. quick. Thanks. That's fine. And you want to do that now before? Yeah, let's just do it. 
so A through E, all of the 15? Correct. Okay. That is the okay. will of the body. Right. <laughs> um, any discussion on that motion? So changing order of the day to take up items 15A through E before 14K. Okay. Uh, seeing none, any opposition to that motion? Just wait for a second for the folks on the phone. Okay, uh, hearing none, then that motion is approved. So, uh, actually, let me do the thing. So the next items on the agenda involve applications for a liquor or marijuana license and or a special land use permit for alcohol or marijuana. The process to review these items is different than the assembly's legislative role because these are administrative or quasi-judicial hearings and require the assembly to be impartial, refrain from ex parte communications, accept and liquor license applications, and make a decision based only on the record before us and testimony today. With that, the next item we have before us is item 15A, resolution number AR 2020-243, a resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly stating its conditional protest regarding the transfer of ownership of a beverage dispensary liquor license Number 4109 for BK LLC DBA Burrito King. Wait, wait. Thank you. Uh, we don't have anyone to testify on this item. Public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Ms. Kennedy. Yes. Mr. Peterson. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson? Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia? Yes. That item passes 11 to 0. We now have before us item 15B, resolution number AR 2020 255, a resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly approving an alcohol special land use permit for beverage dispensary use and license number 4109. For BK LSA DBA Burrito King. Wait, reading. Thank you. We don't have anyone to testify on this item. Public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion on this item? Seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Ms. Kennedy. Yeah. Mr. Peterson. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson? Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia? Yes. That item passes 11 to 0. We now have before us item 15C, resolution number AR 2020 253, a resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly setting public hearing for the first time renewal of and approving the renewal of mar municipal marijuana license for retail establishment Uncle Herbs number M20865, stating the Assembly's wave of protest to the renewal of State of Alaska Marijuana License number 20865. Wave reading. Thank you. We don't have anyone to testify on this item. Public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. As an FYI, if the members have any questions. Uh, we have uh, Ms. Jenna Weltsin and Mr. Lloyd uh, Stiancy yes. uh, available. Mr. Weddleton? Okay, no questions. Um, but I, I just want to, you know, we're getting this because it's a first time renewal. So we had said for a period of two years we would get first time renewals will go up for public hearing. And that ends at the end of this year. So, which is actually renewals are now through August. So we are at the very end of this. I think it's gone fine and it's, I don't feel like we need to continue it. But if anyone does, we would want to, they'd want to contemplate renewing that. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. Ms. Kennedy. Yeah. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yeah. That item passes 11 to 0. 
Next, we have item 15D, resolution number AR 2020-262, a resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly approving a marijuana license and special land use permit for Shift LLC, a marijuana manufacturing facility with license number M23503, doing business as Green Grocer. Wave reading. Thank you. We don't have anyone to testify on this item. Public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Moved to approve. Second. <laughs> Moved and seconded. As an FYI to the members, we have Ms. Jenna Wilson and uh, Ms. Helen Yoon available if you have questions. Mr. Weddleton. Uh, we reviewed this at the Community and Economic Development Committee on July 23rd, and the committee recommends approval. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. Ms. Kennedy. Yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Gwen Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. That item passes 11 to 0. We now have before us item 15E, resolution number AR 2020 263, a resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly. Approving a marijuana license and special land use permit for Shift LLC, a marijuana retail sales establishment with license number M23468, doing business as Green Grocer. Wait, reading. Thank you. We don't have anyone to testify on this item. Public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Moved, Moved to approve. approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion on this item? Mr. Weddleton. Uh, the Community and Economic Development Committee discussed this at length on July 23rd, and the committee recommends approval. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. Yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. That item passes 11 to 0. Uh, now we're back to the 14s, so we now have before us item 14K, ordinance number AO 2020-73, an ordinance authorizing the non-competitive disposal of municipal real property to the state of Alaska located within the Anchorage Coastal Wildlife Refuge. Wave reading. Thank you. We don't have anyone to testify on this item. Public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion on this item? Mr. Weddleton? You know, I, um, this is for whoever, I guess Robin Ward, where's Robin? Um, we, we have other properties, I understand, that are in the Coastal Wildlife Refuge, and I, I wonder, is there a plan to dispose of all of those? Through the chair, this is Robin Ward, the real She's estate director. Uh, Mr. Weddleton, this is, a, this is a property that not necessarily adjacent. Can you hear me? You broke up. Yeah, you, you broke up a little bit, but continue. We can hear you now. Okay. Uh, this piece of property is actually adjacent to the state parcels. The municipality does own some parcels that are within the Anchorage Coastal Wildlife Refuge, but this parcel actually is adjacent to the state parcels. So this was a property tax foreclosure. I believe that the state and also Great Land Trust over the years has tried to purchase this property to put within the refuge. Um, it came to us as a property tax foreclosure and prior to taking clerk's deed, we did talk to um, Fish and Game and they definitely wanted to negotiate uh, a donation. There will be a deed restriction on the conveyance deed that restricts that to conservation of habitat. But to answer your question, we have no other plans to donate any other of the municipal parcels, only this one. I guess the question is, I guess I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. Someday we'll talk about this. Thanks. Someday, Ms. Ward. Uh, thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote.
Ms. Kennedy. Yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. That item passes 11 to 0. We now have before us item 14L, ordinance number AO 2020-70, an ordinance authorizing the continuation of a less than fair market value lease of Heritage Land Bank parcel 40-4-029. Wave reading. Thank you. We don't have anyone to testify on this item. Public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Move Move to approve. approve. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion on this item? Seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Ms. Kennedy. Yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. That item is approved 11 to 0. Next, we have before us item 14M, ordinance number EO 2020-78, an ordinance updating military leave, leave without pay, and non-cashable leave provisions of Anchorage Municipal Code Title III to clarify existing processes and create a new process for the award of non-cashable leave to non-represented employees. We don't have anyone to testify on this item. Public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion on this item? Mr. Weddleton? I, yeah, I had a question for administration to get into this. So I, you know, I mean, some of it seems pretty good. You know, you just clarify the military pay and so on. But it looks like what it's really intended to do is to provide a paid um, parental leave. And it doesn't really discuss that, but it, it puts the pieces in play. And I, I think that's a nice thing. But I have qualms you know we're in a recession because of COVID-19 because of the price of oil and a variety of other things and you know we talked a lot today about a, a you know an eviction tsunami and and you know spending CARES funds to shore up the economy and so on because people are out there and they're hurting and they're losing their jobs and are just scared for their jobs and and then we're offering or preparing to offer um, paid parental leave for part of the municipal employees and I expect once one part gets it the rest will soon after and I just maybe this is a great thing but paid parental leave should probably get a big discussion and this is probably a really bad time to be um, doing something particularly a what I think is a fairly rare benefit in the world of I don't know real business um, or organizations which mine isn't but um, <laughs> um, so I, I, I don't know. I'm, I, I think it's a shame I kind of be opposed to this because of that, though I think the sections with the military pay clarifications are fine. Thanks. I'm not sure if there was a question in there. Well, I, well I, 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 am I right that really this is to pave the way to get paid parental leave? Because our discussion emails to my questions pointed that way. Uh, through the chair to assembly member Weddleton, yes in part so the leave provision that we have had in our personnel code is very complicated and unnecessarily so so that's the first section which you've correctly said is largely in the manner of cleanup we're just simplifying that it makes it a lot easier for sap and other purposes the second one is that we have always had uh, for so long as i'm aware a provision in the code that allows the mayor to issue discretionary awards of non-cashable leave to executives as a kind of good work recognition um, uh, but there's been no similar provision for the non-representative employees and that would seem to us to be an unexplic- inexplicable disparity and so we wanted to do two things we wanted to say if there is a non-representative employee a legal secretary for instance who has done really exceptional work or worked very long hours to get a filing out that there might be circumstances in which instead of a gift card or something you'd be able to say why don't you have you know one more day of leave off that happens rarely I think in the time that I'm aware that we have only had 
I, I know that while I've been municipal manager, I think probably one time that we did a discretionary award of, it, uh, of additional leave to executive as a sort of merit-based reward for work. Uh, when the bus system was changing over. Um, but the second is, uh, yes, we are very interested in doing a paid parental leave program. Um, and we are taken notice that in the, the, in the world, the United States is about the only country that doesn't have some sort of broad-based paid parental leave. It was picked up by Senator Sullivan, by Ivanka Trump. Folks have said that we're going to move in that kind of direction. It's also been independently picked up by an increasing number of employers who are uh, pitching it as an uh, attractive job benefit to sort of uh, make them, I mean, their, their business an employer of choice. And I think we want to position the municipality to be in that category. Um, the good news is it won't happen immediately <laughs> if now is not the time because it will require some SAP reprogramming. So we're not going to implement that SAP reprogramming unless we have the authorization to really do it. The notion would be to come behind it with a policy and procedure that prescribes how we're going to do it. It largely would mirror the Federal Family Medical Leave Act qualifying uh, provisions. Uh, and we would simply say that there is an additional bolus of uh, non-cashable leave for a qualifying event. Um, we're happy to provide more information about all that, but um, I think it is increasingly of interest in the United States and certainly very mainstream around the world. Oh, and the last thing I should mention is that by doing it in this manner, we haven't uh, cascaded it across the various represented unions. It may be the case that the represented, the bargaining units, uh, the unions will be also interested in a provision like this, but they'd have to bargain for it. And there may be bargaining units that are not interested in this. So some of our bargaining units already have a cashable sick leave bank, for instance, that anybody could draw on for these kind of purposes, and they may not need it. Um, but here, because the non-representative employees don't have the similar arrangement, we um, recommended this approach. Thank you. Ms. Zolotel? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I'm in favor of this ordinance. I, the only concern I have is about the additional non-cashable leave. Um, and when I inquired, um, the intent is to issue, for the mayor to issue a policy and procedure document. Um, my concern was I want to provide some kind of certainty and guidance to employees that can be relied upon um, and also for purposes of budgeting, quite frankly. Um, so I'm still considering w whether <clears throat> to bring forward an amendment um, or just put a whereas that it will be something that's issued and published so that it's readily available for employees um, that this would apply to. Um, because I understand allowing it to be discretionary, and it has been discretionary in the past, but as we apply it to more individuals, I feel like some guardrails definitely need to be out there and um, in the public for uh, folks to know what we're operating with. Thank you. Mr. Weddleton? Uh, um, yeah, I guess I... I mean, Mr. Falsey made a point we want to be employer of choice, but when you're in a state with 20% unemployment, just being an employer should be a good thing. I would like to move to remove Section 3 or delete Section 3. Second. Moved and seconded by Ms. Kennedy. Do you want to speak to it? Well, because I think that's where the, um, what in our current economic situation seems like largesse with paid parental leave is rooted in that. And if we move that, then I can vote yes on this. And it's mostly then just clean up that we need. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so, Ms. Aller, did you want to speak to the amendment? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Uh, in, in regards to, um, this is for Mr. Falsey. Does this ordinance, um, 202078, does it affect uh, military leave or does it affect military leave at all? Is this going to have any play in that? Through the chair to Assembly Member Allard, my understanding is that it does not, it doesn't change in substance military leave, that we are just removing it as a separate category for purposes of internal accounting. But no, my understanding is that it's not intended to change any part of the actual way military leave works. Okay, then I probably would be able to vote. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, members may 
Oh, Mr. Fulzi? Sorry for the late-breaking comment, uh, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to add, um, to the extent that I characterize the paid parental leave just as being an employer of choice, I do want to emphasize that I think part of the thinking here is not just that it makes it more attractive for our employees, but that sort of the sins of the parents to inadequately bank enough leave to take care of a newborn child do not pass down to the child. I think increasingly things uh, understood that the, the, the health of the child is improved when at least one parent can be home more often with them. So uh, it, it's not just employer choice. There's also sort of an investment in our future that we're also interested in here. So I just wanted to make that clarifying comment. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion on the amendment, members may proceed to vote. Ms. Kennedy? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Yeah. Ms. Quinn Davidson? No. Mr. Perez Verdia? Mr. Perez Verdia? That amendment fails six to four. We're now back at the main motion. Any further discussion? Ms. Zolotel? Um, thank you. Question, and then I probably will propose my amendment. Um, does Section 3 apply? It applies to other circumstances other than parental leave. That may be the impetus for it, but there could be other discretionary circumstances. Am I reading that correctly? Do the chair to Assemblymember Zolotel, yes, you are. Okay. Um, so on page one, um, if I can do this, um, in the whereas clauses, um, between the whereas clauses um, around line 21, I would propose, whereas the administration will publish policy and procedure guidance and provide covered employees notice of any changes in the policies and procedures when they become effective. And I have that written out for you, Madam Clerk. Is there a second? Second. second? Seconded by Mr. Constant. Ms. Zalatel? I think I addressed it pretty much in my prior comments. This just gives employees some notice and, so, um, and put some guardrails out there for those who want to rely upon this notice or this leave policy. Um, and if it's changing, um, I would hate to see someone kind of counting on something or hoping to get the mayor's discretion on something that seemed to fall within what's been happening otherwise and then not have it happen. Thank you. Mr. Whittleton on the amendment? Uh, sure. You know, I guess it seems okay, but the policy could be the mayor will tell you. Right? I mean, it kind of leaves you where you are. We don't really, I mean, rails on it would be up to 14 days or 30 days or nine months or whatever it would be. If, right? I, if I may, Mr. Chair, there's, there's some rails already in Section 3. Um, but if there's kind of some general operating procedures, like it's going to be used towards parental leave or something like that, then I'm hoping since the administration said the policy and procedure document will be issued, they've got some ideas of how they plan to implement it. There's no rails on here. <laughs> okay, seeing no further discussion on the amendment. I'm sorry, could you repeat the amendment? Sure. Ms. Alatel? I gave it oh. to the clerk. <laughs> Madam Clerk? Yes. At line 21 on the AO, there will be a new whereas that will read, whereas the administration will publish policy and procedure guidance and provide covered employees notice of any changes in the P&Ps when they become effective. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ms.
Members may proceed to vote. Ms. Kennedy. Yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. That amendment passes nine to one. Uh, Mr. Constant? Oh, sure. Let's deal with the main motion first. Um, so we have the main motion before us. Not seeing any other discussion. Members may proceed to vote. Ms. Kennedy? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Peterson? Mr. Peterson? Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson? Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia? Yes. That item passes nine to two. Mr. Constant? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just as a point of order, I would like us to contemplate what our plan is going forward. We have three substantial items left on this agenda and we don't have time probably to address any one of them, let alone all three of them. And so uh, we have a congested agenda for August 11th with one of the more substantive items we've had in, in many years already on that agenda. And so I don't know what the approach is best to do to tackle these three items, whether it's a special meeting or to continue to after that. But I just want us to have that discussion now because I would love not to have a midnight night. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dunbar? Yeah, I'd just like to make a quick pitch for item 14N. I think that one is relatively straightforward. It's supported by the administration. It's supported by the police department. So hopefully we could knock that one out relatively quickly. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Zellatel? And it is my intention, uh, Mr. Chair, to postpone the item of 14O to the meeting of 811. Thank you. Um, with that, we'll go ahead and uh, take up at least one more item, see if we can get that done. Um, so we now have before us item 14N, uh, AO number 2020-75, an ordinance of the Anchorage Assembly amending Anchorage Municipal Code Chapter 3.90 to require transparency of Anchorage Police Department policies and procedures by posting them on the municipal website. Uh, we have one uh, individual to testify. Uh, can we get Mr. Eugene Haberman on the line? Hello? Hi, Mr. Haberman. We are on item 14N, the uh, transparency of APD policies and procedures. Um, you have three minutes. Welcome. Right. Um, I just grab my timer. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, can you hear me? My name is Eugene Carl Um Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'll make a few points here. Number one, um, this uh, requirement uh, to have transparency of cost procedures. Well, yeah, it should be there. And what has happened? Why has it not been updated? But I can't help but remember history. A few years back, I was in court on a ticket with an APD. And I requested a copy of the policy procedures for the APD in the case. It was denied. Later on, I believe you had some litigation. And I think that's what brought you out to have to put it on the website and so forth but you've not been carrying it out, uh, as shown. So there's two parts to this thing. Who is, who is uh, creating this policy procedures? Who's, uh, you know, just putting it on the website? You know, one would think you would have public hearing and the public sees those policy procedures, and when it changes, the public's involved. But there's an unknown factor here. The public doesn't know who's creating what. And you kept these policy procedures in the dark. Another key element dealing with APD is the fact is 
and the protests and concerns around the country has been the concerns about access to the file of the APD officer, because what's happened is situations of cases where there's been a pattern of history of a certain officer doing, you know, but it's been covered up. So here you've got this thing about policies and procedures. But it's a two-way circuit. This has been a basic cover-up, this whole mess, dealing with APD and the police around the country, particularly in APD here. And you need to address and get those policy procedures out. They need to be updated. And it needs to be addressed with the authorization to create those policy procedures and a fair opportunity for the public to have a public hearing in the Anchorage Assembly meeting to address those policy procedures before they become adopted. And you're not doing that. You chose it. And the fact is, there's a big protest, like I said. The fact these officers out there around the country have been, who have had some records, it's been difficult, a difficult for the people to get access to those records. And those records need to come out. And they need to be out, out there for the people to see. So we could see those patterns and there's a problem. Then there's cases. And then we get a more transparent community, and more comfortability among the people that the right people are officers of APD and elsewhere. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, with that, we don't have anyone else to testify. Public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Ms. LaFrance? Move to extend to 11.15. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, Mr. Weddleton, are you in for that or for the other motion? Oh, the motion. Um, any discussion on that? Any opposition to that? Okay. Seeing none, <laughs> then we're going to extend to 11.15. Uh, so now we're back at the motion before us on item 14N. Mr. Weddleton. I just want to make clear, I think the APD is doing this now, and I got a nixel that said, here it is. So this just formalizes that. They support it, and they're doing it, and we're all good, right? Okay, good, thanks. Thank you. <coughs> Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. Ron, that's the motion to extend. <laughs> Ms. Kennedy? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson? Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia? Yes. That item passes 11 to 0. We now have before us item AO number 2020 79. An ordinance amending Anchorage Municipal Code chapters 3.20 and 3.30 relating to the organization and classifications of the executive branch to create an office of equity and justice. We have one individual for testimony, Mr. Rob Corbs Corbusier. Thank you. Out for 15 minutes. Is this complicated? Well. Hi, Mr. Corbusier. This is Felix Rivera. We're on the public testimony for item 14.0. Um, you have three minutes. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rob Corbusier. I'm the executive director for the Alaska State Commission for Human Rights, which is often abbreviated as ASHER. Um, here at the invitation of Assemblymember Allard, who is a commissioner appointed to the Human Rights Commission to ASHER. Um, given the evidence of the subject, I'm going to provide a quick contextual overview of what we do. Uh, it is a seven-member commission appointed by the governor and confirmed by the legislature for five-year terms. It is an apolitical, independent, quasi-judicial state agency that actually predates the U.S. Civil Rights Act. It was established in 1963. It was the first of its kind in the nation, and it was done on the heels of Elizabeth Paratrovich's leadership in the first Anti-Discrimination Act in 1945, but the first of its kind in the United States as well. Our mission is to eliminate and prevent discrimination for all Alaskans. We investigate discrimination in employment, public accommodation, housing, credit financing, 
and government practices based on a person's status in a, in a protected class, such as race, color, religion, sex, national origin, disability, and sometimes age, marital status, pregnancy, and parenthood. We are a fair employment practice agency on contract with the EEOC to enforce the ADA um, and Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. And again, I will uh, note that we just celebrated the 30th anniversary of the ADA and, uh, and thank the Assembly for that uh, recognition. In 2018, we accepted 210 cases for investigation, most of which were employment, and we actually resolved 295 cases, uh, which addressed some of the, the agency's backlog. With what happened in 2019, though, we, our backlog is going back up, and one of our biggest public criticisms is time for investigation. We have a staff of 18, but we have a number of vacancies and are still rebuilding, but it's important for yourselves and the public to understand we are still fully functional, and we are processing cases. One of the Commission's goals is to expand outreach, and this testimony is a component thereof, to inform the public of our function and remind everyone that we are here as a resource. We do have a statewide focus. Uh, we most certainly do take cases of the municipality of Anchorage. And there may be reasons why a complaint comes to Asher instead of the Anchorage Equal Rights Commission. For example, we have a slightly longer kind of equivalent of the statute of limitations. Um, and depending on who the respondent is, a complainant may prefer that we investigate the, the um, respondent rather than AERC. Overall inquiries are get on a downward trend nationwide. I don't necessarily want to speculate as to, to why that is. Um, COVID definitely had a little bit of a decrease. With fewer people employed, we ended up with fewer complaints. But with things reopening, we did see a slight uptick. We do want ASHER to be a resource for the business community, uh, for training and education, because if there are employers and businesses who know the law, they are less likely to end up in discriminatory practices and end up uh, um, hurting a victim and um, generating a complaint with our agency. But we have a lot of work ahead to, uh, to ensure that um, we get rid of discrimination. Thank you. Apologies to interrupt, um, but uh, you are out of time. But I have two folks in the queue for you. Uh, Mr. Constant? Uh, two questions, really. I didn't hear what your position was on this ordinance before us. I heard a lot of history about the EEOC or the State Human Rights Commission. And so I'd like to hear your position on this. And I would also like to hear what that, that body's um, case history is for taking on cases of LGBT discrimination. Um, I'll address the first question first. The commission has not specifically addressed the, this ordinance, um, and so I cannot provide a, a position on the ordinance on behalf of the commission. Um, in terms of addressing LGBTQ issues, um, with the Bostock decision, our preliminary legal analysis uh, based on the fact that our case law relies heavily on federal Title VII interpretations, um, and we are a, an contracted agency with EEOC, we have begun taking LGBTQ discrimination cases. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Allard? Mr. Corbus here, can you um, tell me where your, most of your cases come from within the state of Alaska, please? Well, I don't think I've got a breakdown statewide, but if I was to guess based on what I've seen in my time in the agency, most of our cases still come from the Anchorage Bowl. Can you tell me where your prime location is, please? Um, we are headquartered in Anchorage, but again, we, we do take cases statewide. So when you say you're headquartered in Anchorage, can you actually give me your physical address? Oh, we are at 800 A Street. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, we don't have anyone else on the list to testify. Uh, Ms. Zolotel? Move to continue the public hearing to the meeting of August 11th. Second. Second. Uh, I heard a second by Ms. Kennedy, I believe. Uh, Mr. Dunbar on that motion. Is there some reason you prefer to continue the public hearing as opposed to close the public hearing and then postpone the item? Um. I'd like to continue the public hearing because I actually think there's some interest in this and it's just gotten lost in a lot of what's been happening, um, quite frankly. Um, and um, I think we will have um, a more, um, 
I keep saying this word, but a more fulsome view of this a little bit um, after we have also the CARES Act discussion because that is some of the proposed funding for this. Okay, sounds fulsome to me. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Constant? Yeah. I would actually like to move the, to change the date to the 25th of August because I recognize that the meeting of the 11th of August is going to be crazy. It's going to be second. very full. Okay, so we have a new motion on the floor to uh, change, uh, to postpone, to continue the public hearing to the meeting of August 25th. Um, any other discussion on that motion? Uh, Mr. Dunbar? I guess I'd like to hear briefly from the administration since it is their ordinance if they have any feelings about postponing. Uh, through the chair, Assembly Member Dunbar, um, we were certainly um, supportive of it moving to August 11th, but I think we all realize that the August 11th agenda is going to be quite a long one with everything else that is already on it. So uh, I think we're fine with moving this to the 25th and, and allowing some of these other items to be voted on on the 11th. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. Ms. Kennedy. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Peterson. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Yes. That item passes 11 to 0. All right, so seeing as we have a limited amount of time, I'd rather not open up the public hearing on item 14P. Um, so I would entertain a motion to um, continue uh, this item. Is that the right motion to continue? Uh, yep, to continue this item to the meeting of August 11th. So move. Second. Um, Ms. Kennedy, did you have a separate motion? No, Mr. Chair, that would be my motion as well. Okay. Uh, and, however, I would kind of like a little conversation about August 11th versus the 25th. Sure. So uh, what Ms. Kennedy was saying is that she wanted to have a little discussion between August 11th and the 25th. Um, did you want to um, go ahead and speak to that, Ms. Kennedy? Well, I think we just mentioned that there was going to be a lot on the 11th already. That was um, a remark that I heard from two different people. So um, is the 25th better would be my question. Will we have more time? Thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any other discussion uh, in the queue. So as it stands, the motion is to... Uh, have this on the 11th and uh, on the 11th we can see uh, what we want to do with the agenda as it is presented. It'll be really full. We're not going to be able to get through it all. Mr. Weddleton? You know, that's, that's a, a concern. I think as we all understand, you know, if we overpack an agenda and we can't get to a big item, um, it's really unfair to people lining up out there. I mean, there's a lot of passions here. It's actually pretty exciting. And, uh, um, and I imagine there's people who don't know how we operate are going to be very let down today. They don't get to say a word. And if we go to the 11th and end up there again, I mean, is it realistic? I mean, are we looking at 11th? There's just no way. So I, I don't, um, sorry, folks on the phone, if you can make sure to mute yourself. 
Um, so I, I don't know the agenda on the 11th. I, I just know that we postponed several items today to the 11th. And um, we have the CARES Act funding discussion on the 11th. So there's, there's quite a few things. So I would presume, just based on what we know right now, that it's going to be a full agenda without this item. Mr. Chair, and we also have the uh, purchase of four properties on that agenda. That is, yes, that's true. Thank you. Huh, forgot about that one. And um, the clerk reminds me that we will have the new agenda before us on the 11th. <laughs> so we will likely be going half speed is what the clerk stated. Um, so Ms. Zolotel. Um Yeah, I'd like to know, what would like the sponsors like to do uh, on this? Do you, do you want to set it on the 11th or would, do the sponsors prefer to set it out to the 25th or further? Sure, so there's three of us. So do you want to start Mr. Constant? Uh, it's either further out or a special meeting before. I'm tired, and it's it's either further out or special before. It's one of those two. I just think the 11th is full. Hmm. Correct. Uh, Ms. Quinn Davidson? I don't think it would be appropriate to set a special meeting for this, given that there is no urgency, um, So, or relatively. So I'm fine with either the 11th or 25th, whatever the body thinks makes more sense. I, I don't know everything that's on the agenda for the 11th, so it's hard for me to say whether this makes it too much. But um, if it's easier for the public, we could just do the 25th. It's probably not very helpful. <laughs> um, so um, what Ms. Quinn Davidson said was um, we shouldn't do a special meeting. It should be either be the 11th or the 25th. She wasn't sure if the 11th would be full, but if the 25th is better for the public, then let's do the 25th. Uh, my opinion is... Um, the 25th makes the most sense. So do we want a new motion then? Move to postpone to the 25th. Exactly. To, to continue Could to the meeting the of the public them. To continue the item? Yep. Sorry. Thank you. Thanks. Second. Uh, moved and seconded. Uh, Mr. Whittleton, did you want to speak to that? Uh, no, that's good. Thanks. Okay. Um, so uh, members may proceed to vote on the motion to continue the item to the meeting of August 25th. Ms. Kennedy? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Ms. Quinn Davidson? Yes. Ms. Per Mr. Perez Verdia? Yeah. That motion passes 11 to 0. Um, we do have time uh, for one individual for audience participation. Um, let's go ahead and try to call Mr. Archibald Campbell. Welcome to the voicemail of Okay, um, so we, we will just um, have Mr. Uh, okay, so we will go ahead and add him to our next audience participation at a future meeting. Uh, so with that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. We're adjourned. <laughs>